this particular car. This is the uh, Lancia Delta Integrale Evo 2, the last of the range of the Delta Integrale Group A cars, and this would have been a jolly club entry with the Repsol toe tip colours on. So this car will rally in period, being followed up. Oh dear, we've got David Addison going to be all in a lava as well now because Flying pan and fire, isn't this it, for you? is the Alfa Romeo GTM, one of the standout cars of the European Touring Car Championship of the 1970s. And it's close to a prototype, David, as, as you get with touring cars, while it still kind of looks like a road car. Exactly. The GTA, the Allegorita, the lightweight, was then modified. So that's where the M came from for the Allegorita Modificato. It was only 780 kilograms in weight, kicked out 220 brake horsepower. Uh, not a patch on this Audi Quattro, of course, that was one of the ultimate rally cars. It only had one world championship win, but 600 horsepower, probably plus, actually, if you had a really heavy right foot like Voltarol did to win in San Remo that year. And Martini Lancia's from Group A also rekindle the memories as well, don't they? And the high suspension and the cow guards on the front give you the indication this is in Safari Rally trim. You can see the mirrored out rear windows as well. In those days, drivers would have uh, like cycling helmets with grooves in them uh, to allow airflow and to compete in t-shirts and shorts, probably a little bit frowned on now. In the number three uh, Chevy Monte Carlo SS, now, this was driven by Andy Peasley earlier on. We don't have a uh, start list in front of us at the moment with who is in it, but it sounds as though uh, that would be Andy Peachy again pushing on here with the uh, 800 horsepower. Oh, just gets a little twitchy under braking. That flint wall looks very innocuous as they go by it, but as you're coming up towards it, it is all you see filling your vision. And then to World Rally Championship and Sebastian Ogier in the Red Bull car. And again, Ogier lost himself in his own donut smoke yesterday. And he's in danger of doing the same again today. Four-wheel drive donuts are not the easiest thing to pull off, but he certainly seems to have made a bit of a uh, pastime of it here. In fact, this is Alfred Evans in his Focus WRC, Alfred winner of Rally GB last year. And that was quite a moment, wasn't it? To win Wales oh, Rally yeah. GB as a Welshman, your first World Championship win, your home win as well, which we haven't had for a long, long time. And Alfred Evans' reputation has absolutely soared because of that. Whoops, up against the bales, but hey, you're a rally man, you just bounce off him and carry on, don't you? Hey, that's the way you did that. Uh, second generation rally driver, Father Gwyndaf Evans, a leading light in the Group A era of Fortier and Cosworth, also very much a blue oval man. I guess that's a little bit like you either are a Ford man or you're not really. Born and bred into the Ford family. I think he's a Ford dealer now, isn't he? He was a bus driver for a time. Now, how about this? The 1986 Monte Carlo Rally winning Delta uh, Integrale. This takes us now, Andrew Franzoni's Toyota Tundra, to a completely different discipline of the sport. We started with a touring car. We've now got one of the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series Toyotas. Sounds great, great poise, a really spectacular sort of racing machine. And you'll see one of those in the shootout later on this afternoon as well. You think, OK, a Craftsman truck, 800-odd horsepower, supposed to go around an oval, probably not going to be that great up the hill. Stand by to be surprised, stand by to be thrilled as well by Liam Duran. This car had a big off yesterday as the rear body came apart, so instead of going for a time now, he's going to go for spectacle. 600 horsepower, four-wheel drive, plus more than 600 horsepower now in his Pikes Peak iteration and giving you an indication of just what acceleration an X Group B rally cross car turned Pikes Peak Hill Climber can produce. And bear in mind, yesterday this was bodywork missing, broken suspension, wheels off, uh, and the team has worked brilliantly to get it ready overnight. There's a launch, that gives you an idea of rally cross acceleration as Liam Duran blasts away up towards Flint Wall. And there's what's Carne seat then and complete this run. And behind him, you're going to have a Lamar winning car because from 1999, coming up towards Malcolm Corner, there it is, is the BMW that took a more success with Pierluigi Martini, with Yannick Dalmas, with Joachim Winkelhock behind the wheel. And this 12 cylinder BMW, 580 brake horsepower. It was very much the second car within the team, but the Tom Christensen and JJ Leto entry had already gone off early morning. Toyota then had an accident, huge off, in fact, for Thierry Boots. And it ultimately meant that this BMW came through to win. 
Yeah, huge moment for them and for the team at Williams that have helped with so much of the chassis design. And that V12 engine later went into a BMW X5 that Hans Stuck then set all sorts of records around the Nordschleife with. Because what you need most in an X5, of course, is an X Le Mans motor. Pierre Luigi Martini reunited with that car for the first time and reunited with this car, at least stationary, is the man who drove it in period and who drove so many blue and orange STP liveried, well, predominantly G uh, Dodge products. Uh, it was Richard Petty, number 43 will be permanently associated with him, who was retired after his retirement from the sport more than 20 years ago. So Trent Petty raced competitively, like his father, Lee, before him, spent his entire life, man and boy, in the NASCAR circus. And Richard Petty here this weekend as a guest of honour of uh, the Duke of Richmond, making what he says was probably his last trip outside the USA. Behind him is a very different sort of machine, and it's being hustled on because Stig Blomqvist is driving Nick Jarvis's Austin A105, the car that won the very first British Saloon Car Championship, and he's in danger of catching up to Danny Lawrence here, who is being ever so respectful, understandably so, of the King's car. But the original Stig is charging along behind him. World Rally Champion, Rally Crosser, Circuit Racer. Uh, his son Tom, part of the uh, BMW family for Formula E, having come from DTM. Behind that, you've got the ex-Jim Lotus Cortina. There's the Austin A105. Yeah. Stig Blomqvist just getting there on the line. Then you will have the Lotus Cortina. Andy Middlehurst, who is a great Jim Clark fan, a real authority on Jim Clark as well, behind the wheel of the Lotus Cortina. And a great historic racer as well, who's a very so. successful saloon car racer in his time, particularly, and uh, has stayed with saloons and is a very successful historic racing exponent. And of course, he's got that dark blue helmet with the white peak as well that's so evocative of Jim Clark in his racing career and this comes from our 60th anniversary of the british touring car championship british saloon car championship as it first was and it was in the late 80s that it morphed and we have a red flag possibly because of cars having to slow because of the very yeah. slow richard petty car so i don't think anyone's had an off it's just that the gaps have suddenly shrunk dita cuesta here is the first one to be shown that red flag he will get to the end but the three litre csl batmobile uh, having to ease its pace dita cuesta late 70s now, but the four times European touring car champion, single-seater racer, pro car racer, you name it, associated for so long with BMW. And this is a car he raced in period as well, the CSL, the uh, Coupe, L for lightweight, and the Batmobile Monica, well that came from the wings that were added to it for racing. Spectacular a car as that was in period, so too will this be. This is Austria's Patrick Friersacker. We already saw him lighting up the Red Bull RB8 Formula One car a little while ago. For those who weren't here early this morning, he also puts on a very Red Arrows style display in this Red Bull NASCAR. And so when the hill is live once more, he's got to try and get the speed up to then do his party piece let's just yeah. leave it like that for the moment but it's well <laughs> worth waiting for well, it doesn't need much speed actually to get it started does it he, he he has enough horse powers under his right foot to be able to do all of that and a whole lot more yeah indeed so uh, patrick friesack a former grand prix racer he did yeah. drive for minardi but he has uh, been part of the red bull family for a long long time this toyota camry advertising of course project spielberg in other words the red bull ring the austrian circuit the home of the austrian grand prix and uh, this car from 2007 it's entered by Red Bull UK, but uh, it's a monstrous car and so spectacular. And I think the engine is going to fire up. The red flag, certainly up near the Mulcombe crossing, has been withdrawn. So there's nothing to clear up. Patrick Friesacker is given the go-ahead, and he will accelerate, and he'll try and get the speed up, and then he will slow and almost salute Goodwood House, in a sense. He will get ready for the burnout. Right, that's it. You know the score. Urge him on. Lots of applause, please. Lots of cheering. And in return, you'll get a lot of donuts and a lot of smoke. And that fine silt that lands on you in the next couple of minutes is tyre. So we've had the yellow smoke this morning. Now we're back to the red smoke for the Red Bull livery. Patrick Friasaka can rival the Red Bulls when he goes full smoke on. And the Red Arrows. And the Red Arrows, indeed. The Red yes. Bulls is a completely different aerobatic display team. <laughs> well, more ground level, isn't it? Yes. yes. There's 
Red Bulls, that's the other one to the Red Arrows. It is the other one. I knew I was saying Red Arrows. I heard myself say Red Arrows. You may have heard Red Bulls. I couldn't possibly comment. Go on, Lemming, over the cliff. <laughs> Patrick Friesacker then will stagger his way up the hill, destroying another set of tyres. Is there a Guinness World Record for the longest set of stripes because that has got to be a couple of hundred yards of stripes <laughs> and smoke to yeah. go with it uh, patrick friesacker everybody up towards Malcolm corner another round of applause i think he's needed it's another great display from patrick thanks everybody on the hill coming up out of Malcolm. patrick sure. friesacker knows how to entertain I'm sure the marshals will just be keeping an eye on that car when he gets to the top because there was a little lick of flame inside the left yes indeed you're heart. quite right um, now that may or may not be associated with the entire smoking antics May or may not be associated with smoke. I think it's probably actually from the smoke canisters, and there are plenty of those. It does rather fill your vision, it rather fills the collecting area at the top as well. It fills your nostrils as well, I've just yeah. discovered. Yeah. Uh, after... You get the pungent smell, as does everyone else. Yes. We are not immune. After that, Bobby Labonte will drive the Chevrolet SS, and again, this is another great grunt and go race car. Bobby Labonte accelerating his way up the hill, this car from 2016. Lightning, excellent. Uh, obviously, a musical fan. And uh, then you're going to stay back his car as well. He's yeah. also raced in period. He's here uh, on display and has been up and down the hill a uh, half dozen times. Then you're going to have Prince Leopold von Bayern, the racing baron who drives the 1979 BMW M1. It was a car that had most of its racing exploits in the Pro Car series. Go to him and call him the racing baron. I think the clue is in the name. Oh, sorry. Prince Did I say baron? Von Bayern. I knew I was saying red arrows. I heard Red Bull. <laughs> so. I believe with all sorts of Bavarian heritage livery on the car, this is a car he drove in period. He also raced in the DTM for many years, raced European Touring Car Championship. Still very keen on his motorsport and on his bobsledding. His, uh, his home state, Bavaria, holds one of the world's greatest bobsleigh tracks. And Berchtesgaard well, here linking old and new together is Nick Hamilton in his Clio Cup car that he will be racing continuing throughout this season. Jet sponsorship, which has been a key supporter of Nicholas. You might think, oh, it's going to be easy for him to go racing. Lewis will just pay it out of loose change. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. Nicholas has to go out and get all the sponsorship. And it's doubly difficult because he knocks on so many doors for sponsorship. And the answer is, you don't need sponsorship yeah. because Lewis yeah. will pay for it all. Well, yeah. no, it doesn't happen like that at all. Uh, so Nicholas Hamilton, who's raced for a time in the British Touring Car Championship, has been a regular in the Clio Cup, comes to the end of his run as we now turn to uh, this Chevrolet SS. We've seen Ed Barrier driving it. It's number 17 because that is a homage to the, uh, yeah, the, the King died, Will Spencer behind the wheel this time up the hill. And it's got the Elvis Presley tribute livery. Uh, Ed Barrier, who has driven it earlier, has been a winner in NASCAR in the past. Now Martin Spurrell with the WRC Impreza, the Subaru now coming up the hill. And this is an extra Richard a Robert Reed car with an enormous history. Yeah, fabulous to see so many Burns and Reed cars here from their Subaru eras. And if you enjoy watching the cars on the hill, do try and make sure you go uh, on the inside of Mulcum behind the big hospitality tent and catch a trailer up to the top of the hill to go to the rally stage. It's a full on rally stage and they are giving it the full beans there as you will have seen on the big screen from time to time during the day, but it's well worth going up. They've not only got cars attacking the stage, they've got a huge display up there as well of historic rally cars. And some real rarities there. I can't tell you that I've ever seen a Datsun 240Z on a rally stage. You'll see that there. You'll see a Mercedes E Cosworth, 190 E Cosworth. You'll see all sorts of weird and wonderful rally cars, as well as the ones you're expecting and hoping to see. Yes, on the brand X Richard Burns car. Now we should also have uh, this. Aha! This is the Honda lawnmower. Jessica Hawkins. We've not seen this since Thursday. Uh, Jessica, who's no mean saloon car racer, is given the job of driving this. Well, there's been a lot of grass to cut, David, in fairness, and, and she hit. hasn't quite finished yet. No, so. indeed, she's doing the job properly. Well, just Get off tidy. the tarmac, Jessica. It's yeah. the greeny bit you it all up there for the, uh, for the IDR Volkswagen later on. Does this do donuts? Let's see. Do you know what? I think she's just about to show us. It might she's do a lot to control. Power. Come on, Jessica. Let's see what it can do. It's got a fire blade engine and a, a modified go-kart chassis. 
blasts away, and then let's see. This is a lawnmower like no other. I, I think she is about to discover whether or not it does do donuts. Either that or she's got a little mechanical problem. This is the first time Max oh. has done anything uh, at speed. I was speaking to Steve Neal, boss of Team Dynamics, that uh, built the car. And he said, we've never run it this fast. And the front was very bouncy on Thursday. Yeah. Unfortunately, it does look like she's had a bit uh, of a mechanical. I think the blade belt has come undone, probably. That's usually what happens. So it's a cracking piece of marketing by Honda UK and Team Dynamics. Uh, fabulous piece of kit. Unfortunately, Jessica Hawkins's mower is failing to proceed. So it goes behind the bales to a kind of natural environment for it whilst uh, work <laughs> is done. Uh, we'll see who else we can run up the hill in the meantime whilst the... Uh, it's doing it a disservice to say the Honda lawnmower is attended to. The course car's going to go up the hill. That might actually be the last one from that batch. Uh, so uh, we'll try and catch up with some of the drivers at the top of the hill. But uh, with the uh, Honda lawnmower set to be retrieved, uh, we've had great action once again in that last batch. And up at the top of the hill, drivers are busy chatting not only to themselves, but Bruce Jones. It's getting really hot up in the top paddock. The driver's already getting back on board. There's uh, Prince Leopold von Bayern in that fantastic BMW M1. But the car I want to go down, we're passing a BMW 3-litre CSL. But Steve Soper, a man who's just been thick and thin through touring cars. And uh, this, Steve, is a very, very special BMW M3. Tell us about it. Uh, this car was my 91 DTM car. It won three races in 91. It was then carried over to do spa in 92, 24 hour. And on that particular day, after nine attempts at uh, trying to win the race, I won. And also the same weekend after qualifying, I flew back to London, my daughter, First daughter, Cassia, was born. After she was born, I flew back, started the race. And as I said, after nine attempts, we, we won it. So it's, uh, it's got a little bit of, I'm not very sentimental, but this car's got some value to that. No, it's, it's great to have the cars out again. Thanks very much, Steve. You need to get back on board. I'm just going to wander around a little more. I'm just going to go... Oh, I'm just too late to catch uh, Liam Dorham. He's just putting his helmet on down there. That's the uh, car that lost its engine cover yesterday. Liam's climbing on board. This is a Pikes Peak RS200. And uh, you can see a little bit of repair. It's almost invisible mending, a good bit of black tape. Uh, just see if I can get a thumb up from uh, Liam. How's the car? Is it uh, OK? Uh, Li is it nearly better? It's working. It's working. But this could come off at any minute. OK, if you didn't hear, it's working, but this could come off at any minute. And it certainly gave Liam a mighty scare yesterday afternoon running past the house. Good to see he's fine. And now we're going to walk back up the hill, and uh, here is a car. We have the King, Richard Petty, here, potentially for the last time at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. What is more famous than that Petty Blue? This is trademark blue. The day glow is, is normal. This is a colour mixed specifically for the Petty family. And uh, carrying the 43 on the roof, that is uh, just one of the strongest trademarks you will see in world motor racing history. 200 NASCAR wins. I'm just going to lean in over here, Rob. We've got the... The car that won Le Mans quite some while ago, the BMW car, with one of the drivers, one of the winners, Pierluigi. Great to have you here at uh, the Goodwood Festival of Speed. It's a, big, it's a big pleasure for me to be here for drive uh, this uh, unbelievable car. One of the beauties of this car, it's very attractive to look at, but it was developed with Williams, but that brilliant, brilliant engine in the back. Yes, uh, we have a very strong engine, a very big torque, and uh, it's a very quick uh, engine. And it was also, I really like the days when uh, cars raced at Le Mans without a roof. I thought they were very beautiful cars. Yes, it's very nice and uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a car very quick because uh, in Le Mans it was uh, very important to be quick in the straight line. Exactly so. Thank you so much. So that's Pierluigi Martini who won in 1989, Yannick Dalmas and uh, Joachim Wilkohop as well. So that is it from now from the top of the hill. More to follow. Of four. Absolutely right. Well, we saw the red arrows making plenty of smoke in the sky. You guys are more than matching it downhill, uh, downhill at ground level. And this, for me, is just such a fabulous machine. I understand the engineering of the others enormous, but this just takes me back to Le Mans and, and the master that won in 1991 because it's got the same sort of engine. It does. It has the four rotor peripheral ported, nearly 500 plus horsepower. The, my, Mad Mike would death. The Wadette family resides in New Zealand. Australians love their rotaries. 
And Mad Mike would dead. That's why it has the homage. The RX3 front end built by himself and Rocket Bunny. And, and the back half of it looks familiar because that's an FD RX7. So again, Mad Mike would dead. He also has an event in Liverpool coming up next month. Red Bull Drift Shifters, a very unique event unlike any other drift event or car event you've seen before. If you're a fan of the silver ball, the pinball, it's basically pinball meets drift car. So again, 500 plus horsepower, this Red Bull FD RX7.3 edition because he has he's had so many different kind of uh, visions of this RX7. FD is just such an iconic car. Again, the chassis code and what goes on with it and, and you know, the, the, the Mazda brand and the rotary and what, what, what's come about of it. And there still are those just fanatical fans of this of this tuner culture and just the, the vibe overall. And it just makes that noise take me right back to the 24 hours of Le Mans. That, that's like six foot of flames out the back on the overrun. <laughs> just, you know, you can't get more spectacular. What a great show these guys have put on. And uh, Jared, I hope you'll be coming back to tell us a lot more about it again tomorrow. Most definitely. Styles for miles or, or style for mile in this sense. So thank you guys for having me. As uh, we saw Chris Forsberg, Von Gittin Jr., Baxi Baxi uh, Dean Carnage Carney, James Dean, Mad Mike with that. Thank you guys for having me once again. And yeah, we'll be back here again shredding and tearing. Good job, Jared. Go Send and it. stock yourself up with words again for tomorrow because they come out at such a machine gun rate. That is unbelievable. Good job, my friend. I just like to point out that actually that was Martin doing two different voices. There was only one person <laughs> in the box, but he fooled everybody. Well, let's catch up with Bruce Jones for the final time this afternoon. at the top of the hill. Well, here is the Mad Bull. Here is Mad Mike with it. The dust, the smoke, the flames from this rotary engine Mazda finally coming to a standstill. Mike will hop out and join us. Ever the showman in his Red Bull liveried uh, racer. It started life as a Mazda RX-7. It's been reshaped to be given the vintage nose of earlier Mazdas. And uh, my, Mad Mike with it, climbing out with his retro helmet. Look at that bubble on the front cockpit of his car full of smoke alexander sims helping with the smallest little chalk under the wheels but let's hear a round of applause for the big showman the greatest showman was the latest film but uh, the greatest showman at the festival of speed here he is waving to the crowds mad might win it he's cool he's calm he never gets hot and here's the man who makes the loudest noise in the entirety of the festival of speed and i tell you that is quite an accolade Mad Mike, you've even got the decency to look a little bit warm. Oh, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? Goodwood Festival of Speed just turns it on every year. My fifth year back just gets better and better. So good to have the car up here. And yeah, fans, it's the last run of the day. It's the last car up the hill. Had to make it a good one. Well, it looked like a fantastic one. You said yesterday you'd spotted a couple more places you could pop in some spins. Did you try them? Yeah, certainly did. I mean, we got told we need to be quick. We've got a ball to get through tonight. But um, yeah, we're... It's uh, just every run up the hill, we just push a little bit harder, a little bit faster, and the fans get louder and louder as we come, so really, really cool. Well done. Out with style. Enjoy the ball. Right, thank you very much. Now, out on the hill is this Ford Raptor. It has got Paul Swift at the wheel of it, and if you're wondering how it got there, that's actually not a bad question. Uh, it's the Ford Ranger Raptor, Paul Swift, second generation stuntman, but also no mean rally driver, an auto test in his time as well, uh, has made his way onto the hill and is as spectacular as you might anticipate. But if you want to know how it got there, this is the answer. Out of the undergrowth and over the bales. And that apart from rattling your fillings, is how you get on to the hill at Goodwood in your Ford Raptor Ranger. Excellent stuff from Paul Swift. You might be able to get the Honda lawnmower in the back of that. I understand Jessica Hawkins stopped because the uh, grass bin was full, but it might just fit in the back there. So uh, Paul Swift entertaining us before we move on to our next activity, our next batch of cars. And if you can do donuts in anything, you can certainly try and do them in the Raptor as well, can't you? You think it's not going to work, given the centre of gravity, but it just about does. Now, uh, whether he gets off the hill by vaulting the bales, can't tell you. We might find out in a moment, because either he's going to turn sharp left into the paddock. No, let's keep going. Let's go back up the hill and see whether he can go to the bales. There might be more donuts to do first. Let's see. 
Come on, give him some encouragement, everybody, up near the crossing at Malcolm. Right outside our window. Excellent. Shut everything up, or we'll be full of grass dust as well as everything else. Arm out the window, lots of opposite lock, lots of off-roading, which befits <laughs> the car. Absolutely. Well done, Paul Swift. Big round of applause for him as he goes past you. He knows how to make an entrance as well. And if you weren't covered in dust or smoke or burnt rubber before, you might be now. It's all part of your day here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed presented by Mastercard. And I'm sure the Duchess's lawn will recover. It says here, <laughs> yes. Yeah, just in time for next year when we invite Paul back, yes. <laughs> so he goes up there towards Flint Wall. Uh, to the right-hand side there is the rally stage, which is in operation all day. There's also, just going back to 70 years of Porsche, the Porsche experience, which is well worth a look. But we're not done yet with Paul Swift because we need to get him off the course. Well, there are some more donuts to serve up first. He's waited a while to come and have his moment here. Uh, there were dramas with it yesterday, but today he's gone great guns. And Paul Swift... He's going to go and be all gentlemanly at the end. Instead of jumping yeah. it back over the bales, he's going to go through the finish line. Nothing to do with me, Gov. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you almost take me for somebody else. You sure I didn't see him go the other way? <laughs> so, excellent stuff from Paul Swift. And uh, our next batch is going to be the Porsches once more. They'll be coming up shortly. Well, I'm afraid to say, if you're not down here right now, I don't know where you are, but you are missing out. It's all popping off at the gas arena. You can, you've got enough time. Get down quickly now, because you've got some of the world's best riders, stunt riders from the world of BMX, motocross, FMX, and it's all, like you can see behind me, the crowds are already getting geared up. In fact, it's got a lot busier. Lee behind me here is going to do a few little stunts. He's giving it a whirl. Watch. So straight in with the kitchen sink. Yeah. This one is called. Give him a round of applause. This is exciting. The balance, the freestyle control, breakless on this bike. Yeah, give him a round of applause. Hey. So then, what's coming up next? Lee Muscle White is building up a bit of speed. We've got some special surface on the top of this platform here so we can get extra grip. He's winding it up. Let's get that atmosphere going. Give him a round of applause. Check this out. It's the plug hole. Yes! Oh, my no, no, word. No. Okay, we've got time for two more tricks. Two more. Come on. What are we going to go for? What are we He's building up some speed. It's getting ultra funky up in here. Oh! Woo! Yes! This incredible control. He said it took him 10 years to master that trick. Can we show some appreciation? Have we got one more trick? We're starting the ribbon clap. Well, there you go. I don't need to say any more, really. Um, if you hurry up and get down here, there's going to be all sorts of tricks going off. I think uh, Dougie Lampkin is going to be jumping over another rider at some point. You will not want to miss it. This is literally going to be the perfect iPhone and Instagram fodder. So get yourself down here. And welcome to the rally stage at the Goodwood Festival of Speed, where we have started the afternoon's action. The sun has remained out. We have loads of spectators uh, enjoying the action that we have here. And we're looking at some of the highlights. We have Maxime Castella uh, with the Saab 99. A uh, very good example of one of the cars that we have here, another of the many evokes memories of Paddy Hopkirk, but it evokes memories too of the controversy on the Monte Carlo. Uh, Lancia Fulvo 1.3, another good example of some of the class of cars that we have here, where we're celebrating uh, 50 years of the Ford Escort as we watch the big Triumph TR7 V8 make its way into the stage. And we have cars from every single era. We have Audi Quattro's Mark 1 Escorts, Mark 2 Escorts, cars such as the TR7, very popular in the late 80s, of course, the Datsun 240Z, the Datsun 260Z. And of course the flying fin jump with the number boards where there was an award presented at lunchtime for the longest jump. Jim Valentine's glorious AMC 5.7 litre. And the Austin Maxi that we saw in action both yesterday and today. Wonderful variation of cars that we have here on the stage. The Belga, the famous Belga Porsche. This driven by Johann Frank Driegs, a regular visitor to the Goodwood Festival of Speed, and he said he wouldn't be anywhere else. We have World Rally cars, we have Mark 1 Escorts, as I've said. We have current World Rally cars. 
and the glorious sound of Metro 6R4. The heady days of Group B with the Audi Quattro S1 Evolution 2. And this is the WD40 sponsored car. This was Janice McGee over the jump earlier on. And a wonderful glimpse inside a current WRC car. David Wright's Ford Focus. And of course, memories of Juha Kankinen and Carla Sainz in the Repsol sponsored car. We've been lucky enough to have the likes of Elvin Evans, winner of Wheels Rally GB with us today. And a couple of lucky passengers who've been able to sample the delights of the latest in technology from the 2018 World Rally Cars. Elfin set in a very, very good time of 2 minutes 27.1 today. And And we're going to go back and join David and the team down at the hill. Zav, thanks very much indeed. Good to catch up on what's going on on the rally stage. And a little bit earlier on in the day, whilst we were enjoying the Red Arrows, we kind of missed out a little bit on the bikes that were going up the hill, and we thought that didn't really do them justice. So let's have a look back at some of the bikes that were going up the hill, and who better to explain all? I'm joined by Barry Natley. Well, we had manufacturer's bikes at the end of the supercar run, and this is the Yamaha Nikin, which was an absolutely fantastic, a brand new thing, 900cc triple, and Josh Brooks was the man at the helm when it went up the hill that time. Uh, Josh Brooks, who basically, in fact, that is the sales director of Yamaha, of course, so that even confuses me even more. We had the brand new YZ. Uh, YZ M1R, we had new Fireblade from Honda, all of these are brand new 2018 bikes. Honda have also introduced a brand new street bike, which is particularly interesting. They've joined the Street Fighter Club at last and doing a good job. The new Fireblade was looking pretty good. We also had the RCV 213V, which is the brand new road-going version of the Moto Grand Prix bike. Journalists have been queuing up all week long to ride these bikes, and I'm not surprised. BMW had the HP4 race here, which is the carbon fiber frame and wheel version of the S1000RR, which sells for 15,000 pounds. The HP4 sells for 85,000 pounds. So a big difference in the price. There, the naked Honda. And uh, the aerial is here too, the great big aerial. And this, the Arch Motorcycles bike. Would you believe 2,023cc in the s and really? e twin engine? Just a Agreed. massive, a massive great big. But just look at the chain flipping on that. These, as I say, and that, the Boxer Twin, the BMW R9T, a little play on words. r 90 being the old version of it. They went through R60, R75, R90, this, the R9T, with a cylinder so much higher in the chassis, and that makes it easier for cornering. There was a race series for the Boxer Twins. BMW here in force, Honda here in force, Yamaha, of course. Kawasaki have got their TT bikes. And this, a Manx Norton powered Fredder. Built by Fred Walmsley, the man who builds the Manx Nortons that compete for us and win races in the revival. Freddie Spencer's RS500 triple in Rothman's livery is here. This race winning bike, Freddie, of course, winner of two titles, 1983, 1985 and uh, the 250 title in the same year. 65 bikes in total, and then add a further 10. There, the Kevin Schwartz replica written by Steve Parrish. That owned, bike owned by Gary Taylor, former Suzuki team manager for many, many years. So the connection there, very strong. We also had a strong contingent of flat trackers from the USA. That, the 1980 Harley XR750. The Harleys have changed very little over the years. Husqvarna 500V. Sammy Miller's bought some great bikes here as well. This one, in actual fact, not the Husqvarna. He's brought something completely different. 
That's a Honda 4 replica. That isn't a replica at all. That's the real deal. That's a Ducati 888. John Hackett on board, who has prepared and tuned so many Ducati V-Twins for BSB teams over the years. That's his own bike, which he cherishes and looks after and is delighted to bring it out and have a good old shufty round. Ducati Panigale, Randy Mamola on board that bike, wheeling it up. He's the man who is Ducati's ambassador on the MotoGP trail and gives rides pillion shots for the guys. And there you can see the Moto2 bike with Gino Rea on board. He's fighting hard in British Superbikes, but that was the sort of bike he was riding in Moto2, the FTR. Barry, thank you very, very much. It's always great to appreciate the efforts of the two-wheel side of motorsport. The bikes, of course, will be coming up later on in the day. Uh, they will be, he says, not that far off, actually. We should be having them again in around right about an hour, if not less. Uh, Porsche, you know the story. It's 70 years. Four years after the Second World War finished, they started manufacturing cars, and the lines of the 911 remain as prominent now as they did then. The first cars in this batch, Martin Haven, will come from the Porsche Museum. They'll have a run up the hill, uh, and then we'll bring them back down again. We've had our Porsche moment for the day, so this is going to be our last opportunity at this year's Festival of Speed to have a look at some great cars, some great lines, and a real, and I know I hate the word, it's a design icon, the 911, and this next run will prove why. The cars get away, Martin Haven and David Addison looking down on the Goodwood Hill as the 911s lead the pack away. We'll go road car, then race car. Well, this is a morphing, isn't it, of the design from the original clean lines of the very first 911, which also was the four-cylinder version, the 912 shared that body, and then we see how it grows to accommodate more safety features, more power, Power, more grip, better brakes, better tyres, but the purity of the original line is still, it is still one of the great automotive designs. You look at the very earliest 356 that Mark Webber drove up the hill uh, an hour or so ago, and that is very much replicated in this light, gentle, delicate 911. You know, at that stage, not a sledgehammer that it became in the turbo era, but very much a, a really refined little sports car. Moving through to the yellow car, the 911 Carrera RSR, and this car, particularly in lightweight guys, was a real track weapon. Bigger brakes, bigger tyres, more power, just growing a little bit of width. The 959, the silver car, four-wheel drive, real tour de force, technically, but again, with all of the styling cues directly derived from the 911 uh, range. Then we move from air-cooled <gasps> into water-cooled, and the power continued to grow. Uh, the world didn't stop spinning, did it, because no. of that change? But well, some worlds did, but uh, not let me know. The, the, the genius in all of this is that through each decade, through each new model, the line of the original car has still been there. Mm. And it's a great example of how you make something modern and yet you keep faithful to the original. And then when you look at competition cars, here we go to the ex-Jim Clark, uh, now Tom Pede owned 356. This was the car with which Jim did quite a lot of driving on the road and also racing and race winning. Had 12 race victories with this car. And he's catching up to the very first Porsche chassis, as you said. It hit the roads in March 1948, so actually just under three years after the end of World War II. And you look at the design, not of so much of this car, but of the one in front, and it's almost like you ask a design student, design a Porsche that looks like a Porsche but doesn't look like any actual Porsche. And that's what that original 356, the pre-A Roadster, looks like. The little inset lights, those tiny little chrome strips, and actually notice a cologne registration. So many of the cars you'll see here with the S for Stuttgart, which is where the Porsche factory owned up, uh, ended up near Zuffenhausen, but a K for cologne registration on the very earliest cars. And a K was very familiar nomenclature as well for the 917, the Kurzheck, which we've got here, the short tail version of the 917. And this car, one of two iconic Steve McQueen film cars here at Goodwood this weekend. And again, where else would you get that? This car used in the filming of the 1970 Le Mans film. It was used as a camera car in the race, used as Michael Delaney's own car in the movie that was released at the end of 1970. And the Bullet Mustang, driven by Detective Frank Bullet in Steve McQueen's other most famous film, is here as well. Oh, and this is the greatest escape motorcycle, frankly. That's next year. Yeah, well, yes. there you go. That should be with Barry. Absolutely.
So we'll go through the three five sixes because we've uh, also got uh, in and amongst them uh, the Carrera Coupe, and then we'll turn our attention to more race-bred cars like this 911 RSR from the 1994 German GT Championship. It was a Ralph Kellner's race car for uh, Rook Racing, and uh, it did win the ADAC GT Cup that year. Uh, and compare and contrast that with the 911 GT1 Evo, which you're going to see in the hands of Mark Sumter. That's coming up the hill now towards Malcolm. The ex-Bob Wallach, here it is, Bob Wallach, Emmanuel Collar, Max Angeleli car. It was the Evo version of the 911 GT1. So it uh, had the same twin turbo engine as the original car, but better aero, and therefore it was much, much faster. But I had to deal with things like Alton Park on a bank holiday Monday in March and Snetterton. So it was it was very much a big, big car in a small, small race circuit. Indeed so, yeah, yes. Mark it. Sumter did a great job to wheel that car around. Well, John Greasley was the, the, the main guy of the yes, time, wasn't he? I think Mark Sumter, in fairness, was yeah. more of a 911 guy, but he's got hold of this now, this yeah. car for historic racing, because the GT Legends category is growing. Now, here you go back to a race built pre-66 911. It's James Turner's car as a Tuttle built car for the new Peter Auto Porsche series in the Paul Smith stripy livery, which on Thursday, when we first saw it, I wasn't sure about, but it grows on you. Well, I tell you what, as a commentator, you're not going to mistake any other car no. for that one, are you? You know, that's one of the great things about an outstanding livery like that whether it's your choice or not it makes life very easy for spotting it and i love the number plate as well two litre two ltr yeah, just to remind the, you it's the it's the purple car it's the turquoise car it's the green it's the, again you know outstanding livery the norse hydro uh, aluminium car uh, which was driven by helen heisman and oscar larari run by brun motorsport a, another easy to spot car even in the days when race numbers got smaller and smaller this car another of the group c era vehicles that we've seen and delighted in seeing up and down the hill all weekend. Anthony Reid at the wheel of it. Then you go to Robert Fellows at the 356B, Carrera Abarth. Now, because Porsche by this stage was so focused on trying to build a Formula One car, and we saw that earlier, they went to Abarth to try and help design a GT car. Behind that comes Andrew Smith here in number 531, which is the Carrera RSR. Andrew, who uh, has a nice collection of historic race cars and is a very handy peddler. He's been a race winner at Revival in a members' meeting, for example. And then Neil Jean in the ultimate thus far, as Martin made the point earlier, uh, Le Mans Porsche. This car for the man that won in 2016 with 1140 brake horsepower, so much more downforce because he's been taken away from, he's been let off the leash, he doesn't need to comply with any regulations now. This just has to be an engineering masterpiece, and it is so. Yeah, Neil Gianni not entirely certain they're going to go out and try and shatter any other lap records. They thought Spa and the Nür Nürburgring Nord cycle were the ones. So this might be the last time we actually see that car moving at speed. Incidentally, down in the Porsche static displays is the LMP2000, the V10 engine car that was due to take over at the end of the GT era into the prototype era. The should have raced at Le Mans the money instead. Instead went to develop it, developing the Cayenne, which in turn saved the company and, and gave them the money to develop new cars, new models for racing as well as for the road. Ryder Becker with the 910 and then Andrew Higgins in the Porsche 935. You've got quite a few examples of the 935 here this weekend. This is the Bob Aiken Coca-Cola livery car from the IMSA scene from America. Uh, then behind that, you're going to have Peter Harburg with the 91730, the Penske team, Mark Donoghue, Can-Am car. There it is. That was so good. We were talking about this yesterday that it was one of those sledgehammers cracking a nut. It effectively killed off Can-Am because nobody else could compete with the technology nor the budget. Almost like Bruce and Denny did with the McLaren earlier yeah. but this actually did end is that the hill we're driving in though well it's not shown as such but it might no. be because it's a different it helmet we've seen in the past wasn't quite sure yeah. and then you will have william oh, no, and you know right. i recognize right. the helmet right. from some of that is Vern chopin now i don't think he raised that in period but it's it, as we saw with anthony reed you know wander around the collecting area long enough with a helmet somebody's going to go oh do you fancy it yes please yeah you're right <laughs> Right. Lawrence Van Tour said exactly the same thing. He, he saw the uh, 98 Le Mans winner uh, uh, going up the hill and he's just been badging people. Going, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. That's my childhood poster car. Well, there's William Hyanson in the 911 Carrera RSR. That is Richard Atwood in the Porsche 804. It was a Grand Prix winner. You don't really think single-seaters when you think of Porsche, but they did have the 7182. There was this 804 and the 2708, the car that's here as a static display, which was... Uh, an entry for the IndyCar scene. Yep. But this car, the ex-Dan Gurney, French Grand Prix winning Porsche, goes through the finish line.
Then we're going to have the ex David Piper 917 yeah. in the Piper green colours. That car also involved in the filming after the Le Mans 24 hours of the Le Mans movie. And again, another 917 with an iconic livery. And here is the trust Porsche of this 956, almost the last 956 built, delivered to Trust Team in Japan. With their familiar Iseki livery, it went testing but never raced in period, only it was a historic car because the advanced 962 came along and everybody thought that they would immediately change to that. And if you had an old 956, the team knew they were going to be outpaced and so they immediately mothballed it. There is Massimo Tosti in the 550 Spider, which you still do a double take at every time you see it with the quirky aero atop the car. Uh, this car from 1956, fast and agile it may have been, but uh, strange in its look. It was the Swiss engineer Michel May who was one of the earliest uh, innovators with the aerodynamics, and he fitted this inverted wing above the cockpit to try to enhance the grip. Then you've got Joe Twyman in the 911 Carrara, Carrera RSR from IROC days, the international race of champions, was what IROC stood for. This Peter Revson's car. Joe Twyman is no stranger to uh, myriad historic cars. <laughs> no, absolutely. Find, find an open door, you'll find Joe Twyman on the other side of it, jumping yeah. in. Yeah, the, in those days of IROC, you would get all the NASCAR drivers, Formula One drivers, IMSA drivers, European sports car races competing in identical, but uh, initially Porsches for a period against each other before it became a pretty much NASCAR dominated event. This uh, 904 Carrera GTS driven by Philip Basil. This is the six-cylinder version of the Carrera. And there is the ex-Vic Elford 911 in the hands of Rob Russell, a car that Vic rallied, rally crossed and raced. It was owned by AFN, and it would go out of a weekend to compete somewhere in something and come back and go back into the showroom. It looks far smarter now than it did at the time, but uh, Rob Russell looks after this car and goes very, very nicely with it. Also, you've got Heath Van Lennart, the Dutch Middle Mall winner, and sometime Formula One driver with the 911 RSR. We've been talking about aerodynamics and rear wings. Well, here's another mighty example, the uh, huge huge picnic tray on the back, trying to increase the downforce for the ball sound straight. Not running entirely smoothly off cam, that car right, either. Right. Here's an eight-cylinder 904. Bless the members meeting to have more than half a dozen of these cars. Never even seen one move in my life before, never mind have half a grid of them. Fabulous pieces of kit. And then behind it, there will be this, which is the 911 RSR, the Le Mans class winning car in the Pink Pig livery, the Anatole Lapine designed colour scheme for the 1971 Porsche 917 of Villicausen and Reinhold Years, brought back this year to celebrate 70 years of Porsche. Stunning looking car and steeped in success already. It's already been driven by two of the three men that won the race Lawrence Van Toy Kevin Astro, this time Nick Tandy behind the wheel. Well, Nick said to me on Friday he wasn't here for the rest of the weekend, so he might have come back for a go, you're never sure. Things may have changed. Indeed so. But it's just fabulous. Nick was in one of the rival cars. Uh, he's had a alternator problem and dropped back. You're going to see the 911 SC Parry Dakar car as well, but what a noise that Porsche makes. So different from your average, if you can have an average Porsche sound. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly right. I'm sure the real cognoscenti can define the age or the era of Porsche just by the engine note. To say a definitely car. This 911 SC, the forerunner to the 959, but it is a car that competed. It did have four-wheel drive, big ground clearance as well for the Paris Dakar. Competed and won in the Paris Dakar. That's Jeff Svart's car from Pikes Peak again. <laughs> find an event, you find a Porsche, and that car climbs the hill, that comes out of the Porsche Rally Cars section. And Andile, the big North American tuner, they were very, very successful in all sorts of Porsche racing, particularly in the IMSA category. There's the 961, the case Nerov had dramas with at Le Mans, but it's been driven here by Gunter Stekernig. The 959, for racing purposes, morphed into the 961. It was a great idea, maybe ahead of its time to a degree, and it was heavy because of the four-wheel drive transmission and the weather decided to sneer at Porsche rather, yeah. than, rather than help that year. But this, the car that won at Le Mans in 1998, the Porsche 911 GT1. You can see the hint of a 911 in there, but yeah. this was against the Mercedes, one of the two cars that rather destroyed FIA GT racing at the end of the 90s because the, the cars went away from being GT to purpose-built race cars that then occasionally they might have just seen a road. And another Porsche Le Mans winner says, I want to go, if he's having a go, I want to go in that. So Brendan Hartley gets his chance to experience a car that was a race winner 20 years earlier. 
the Moby Dick Porsche 935, another fabulous car, had this long whale tail, it was able to do 228 miles an hour on the Mulsanne straight, we've had John Fitzpatrick driving it over the weekend, it was the Rolf Stommel and Manfred Schurti car in period 8th at Le Mans when it made its debut and it is in the martini colours, another of those cars that you just stop and soak in, don't you? Yeah, absolutely right. There's so much going on here. This 9082, again, another classic Porsche shape, open prototype. As convincing at Le Mans as on the Nordschleife as on the European hill climb circuit. You can imagine this whistling round, something like the Targa Florio as well. Proper road racer. Just about with the two seats, mirror at the front. <laughs> uh, here you have Bafal Ahmed, Ahmed Talabani with his 911 Carrera RSR, the Brumos team car, yeah. the familiar red, white, and blue colour scheme. And of course, that might be unusual to European guests, but for the Americans, they were 10 a penny. They were Brumos Porsches coming out season after season. Yeah, familiar number 95, the red and blue stripes, and Hurley Hayward here, who was so closely associated with Brumos Porsche for so many years. And he's driven one of his own cars up the hill just a little earlier on. Uh, Volterol now has handed over the Carrera GT, his favourite Porsche of all time. Volterol, of course, started in a number of different, with a number of different manufacturers, Opel and then Audi, but then has been a, a Porsche ambassador for the last 20 or so years, and he says this car is absolutely his favourite. He told that to our Bruce Jones up at the top of the hill an hour or so ago. Bruce is in amongst the drivers still. It's so hard to know where to look. Andy Prill, a man immersed in Porsche racing. Let's talk about the car we're next to, the 964 from the 90s, that uh, an amazing record on the circuits. Absolutely, this car did a lot of racing in period. Actually had the honour of winning the 93 Spa 24 hours outright. Um, in fairness to it, it was uh, beating all the prototypes at the time that the poor King of Belgium passed away, and the Belgian authorities thought it would be um, a good idea to cut the race short. So uh, Ralph Kellen and his, and his teammate uh, crossed the line first, and uh, another great Porsche victory, and an unexpected one of that. It's the only Spa 24 hours that lasted 15 and a half hours, but you'll take the discount. Follow me round with Rob, because we're going to go and look at, look at a... Sorry, minding the door, nearly uh, touched the door on a 917 there. We're going around to a car that not so many people know, Andy, is, is, a, is a Porsche. It looks like an A-bar, but it's a 365 three, Competizione. 356, yes, it's a 356B. When Porsche realised that their GT, their standard GT356 wasn't going to cut it and they didn't have the 904 ready, they did an amalgamation with Italian bodybuilders and reduced the drag significantly. So it's an all-aluminium construction, one of just 20 cars made. This car has two Targa floor two Tour de France's uh, and a Le Mans under its belt. So you see it presented here today in the French blue, um, but when it was a works car at Targa Florio, it was silver with a orange front. It's a very, very special car, very, very unique these days, and um, what a pleasure to have it here. Well, it's brilliant. Uh, that's what it's about, a history lesson. Andy, thank you very much. I'm just going to beetle up the hill a little bit because uh, swerving up here, beautiful-looking 911 RSR just before Will I Anson gets on board. Great car, raced in the States, Brumos racing, but it's not white with the red and blue on board. Why not? It was, and it's not because they, the, obviously the Daytona car went back to the factory, and which left them without a car. So they had to negotiate with uh, Dr. David Helmick to use his newly supplied car. And so that's the reason why it's in yellow, because this is the car they got and negotiated with him, and he got a stint in the race. and. Those stories wouldn't happen these days, would they? They wouldn't, which is... Yeah, no, it wouldn't, you know, and it's, it's been nice having Hurley here this weekend, hearing it from him. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, no, does I it? Know. I mean, Hurley is a man of many, many stories. It was great to hear those from him, but you've got to get back on board, but it's great to see it. And, and just for a car like this to win a race like the Daytona 24 hours, it's, very it's wonderful. isn't it? Yeah, I mean... Uh, no, not Daytona, it's Sebring. No, it's Sebring, sorry, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's very special, and it's a great thing to drive. I'll, it? Bet it, I'll bet it is. Very, very popular. And we're just going to walk on up the paddock a little bit more. Rob follows me, of course. Porsche, you think sports cars? Look at this. Richard Atwood in the 1962 French Grand Prix uh, winning 804. It's a great car, isn't it, Richard? Well, yeah, it's, uh, we've, I've now run it a few times every day, run it twice. And um, we, we, after about the first two days, we found first gear. We didn't, you know, we, so it was very good, but now it's, it's great. It, uh, it's very much like any one and a half litre car of that era, you know, the one and a half really litre high it. revving, you know, eight cylinder jobs. So it's uh, very similar to the BRM type of thing, really. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Great to have it here. Great to see you, of course, deep in the Porsche world. 
Thank you very much, Richard. I'm going to carry on just looking what else we have. If Rob follows Moon up the hill, look, I look at those martini stripes. Isn't that absolutely fantastic? Looking brilliant in the sunshine. But if you want a bit of ground clearance, how about this? When Jackie Ickes used to go on the Paris Dakar, these phenomenal 911s that, and the terrain they had thrown at them were, it was just extraordinary. Now, come round the front, Rob, and uh, this is a. A livery from the early 1970s, 1971, revised this year, brought out. The drivers voted for this one. They went to the Porsche Museum. And in the hands of Lawrence Van Tor, Kevin Estra and Michael Christensen, they went out to win the GTE Pro class. And if you come and look right here, Rob, three, three little things on top of the wing mirror. Each of the drivers sneaked in before the car was sealed with its Le Monde dirt. Didn't tell anyone. They put their thumbprints on top. So they're now sealed in forever. And the pink pig very much back in people's imagination. And let's just walk on out through the top of the Porsche paddock, nearly at the top. I can't bear the fact we're not going to see these again this weekend. Over here, of course, is the 911 the 919 hybrid Evo in which the lap records at the classic circuits of Spa-Francorchamps and Nürburgring Nordschleife have been shattered. Unfortunately, not tilting for it here this weekend, but this is a truly phenomenal car. It didn't take one or two seconds off. It took closer to 10 seconds off the lap time. Absolutely amazing. And I think the final... Final sweep will be back over the shoulders of the massive Porsche 91730 in blue and yellow. The ultimate key vacation. Vern Schuppen on board there. That was one of the most powerful Porsches of all time. So with a tear in my eye, that's it from the top of the hill. As you're walking around Goodwood, if you keep your eyes peeled, you can sometimes bump into some absolute legends. Didn't expect to bump into you, and I think I wish I'd bought a stepladder, Martin. I can't quite reach. How are you doing? I'm very well. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. What brings you to Goodwood this weekend? I'm with Land Rover. So, uh, yeah, just enjoying it. And uh, been on the Land Rover stand and having a great time. Have you had a rag around in anything yet? I went up the hill in an I-Pace Jaguar, but they had to take it steady. But no, it was, it was good, yeah. I've had a little bit of a look round. I'm going to do a bit more later on. You, you could do with a week to look round, really, couldn't you? There's cars everywhere, aren't there? Wherever you turn, there's something special, yeah. Amazing. And will you be, if people come up to you, will you be letting them have a quick selfie with you, won't you? No. no. Yeah, of course we'll. <laughs> of course we'll. So on the Jaguar Land Rover stand, obviously, they're doing um, experiences, so you can yeah. jump in the cars, can't you? You can go on, I think, uh, what are they doing with that one? Sliding it round and... Yeah, some drag. And some off-road stuff and all. It's all going on, yeah, fantastic. Some hill climbs, I think, if you get in that queue over there. Yeah, it's all it's all happening. I've not done it yet. I haven't had a chance to do it yet. But Neither have I. I think we should have a go, don't yeah, you? Yeah, possibly. I think we get to the front of the queue, but it doesn't work like that, does it? So. You can't always queue jump. No. Sorry. But when you're that tall, no-one's going to mess with you, are they? Yeah, no. You've got a queue. You've got a queue. We'll make your way down to Jaguar Land Rover. All sorts going on here, and obviously you can meet legends like this chap. This brings us bang up to date. This is the fastest car here this weekend at 43.05 seconds. It has the record at Pikes Peak, 7 minutes 57 up there. Electric technology from the Volkswagen IDR Pikes Peak. Roman Duma is at the wheel of the car, and now it won't be the noisiest, but by my word, it's going to be quick, because Roman Duma is about to blast away. <laughs> You're riding on board through the bales, through the trees, double apex right, and then onto Park Street. Ooh, Bit of a twitch. Grass. Runs a little bit wide, but he saves it. Roman Dumas is perhaps going to be the match. Meet the, the shoes and he's off the road. Is he going to be able to hang on to this? He's still on the grass. Got Roman back to the black pit. Yes, well held that wow. man. Everybody breathes a big sigh of relief. He can't do that in the shootout because then he will lose so much time. And there you have a car perhaps now just being driven a little bit more chasing than going up through Malcolm <laughs> Corner. That was a dramatic start to the day. And what you're looking at now is not only state-of-the-art electric technology, but inside it, Martin Haven, a massive laundry bill. A massive laundry bill. That was a proper Cody Brown moment. He did well to hang on to that. It is not the smoothest runoff. It's bone dry as opposed to a soaking wet which is probably uh, a little bit of what saved him. Of course, with an electric motor driving each of the axles in this car, he does have four-wheel drive. The problem is he's got instant torque and instant power. It's all there, so that was a big old save. But immediately he came off the line. He got onto the grass on the right-hand side before he even got to the first of the right-handers. That put him offline. He twitched to get it back under control and then went off in the double right at the bottom of the hill. And from there, on in it was avoid the bales at all costs and that was the age-old story he looked where he wanted to go because the oh. car follows the eyes that, that was got... a savage twitch and a yeah. big jump as well as he hit the grass mm. well saved Roman. 
there were some very nervous faces at Volkswagen as that got close to the bales. Well, we saw the Honda lawnmower on Thursday, didn't we? I didn't think we were going to see a Volkswagen lawnmower here, but we sure have. That's the ultimate lawnmower. Yeah, Whoa. that's a bumpy old ride, and the suspension travel there, absolutely zero. All eyes are on the hill today, but most notably for the shootout this afternoon. Romain Dumas, you've been fastest of all in this incredible VW Pikes Peak car, but now you've joined the drift drivers by the looks of things, down by the house, a big sideways moment on the grass. Oh yeah, you can say like that, yeah, it was a, I think it's the first time I slide like that with this car. Uh, it was a, yeah, we, I think we, <laughs> we found the limit. I don't know if it was some dust from the car before, or I just lost the car. It was a good slide, actually, I said, now if I back off, I think I'm, we'll finish on a, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, somewhere on the back or close to the tree, so I was okay after I, I went, I cruised to the top, I knew it was uh, was over, but uh, yeah, and now I know where the limit. <laughs> yeah, now you know where the limit, you've been working towards it, working hard on all sorts of things. Yesterday you said you went too soft on the tyres and were bottoming, and when when you look at the onboard footage you can hear it. Yeah, for sure, yesterday we were a little bit uh, too low, and uh, yeah, now we, we rise the car up a little bit, uh, for sure. We didn't get a lot of info right now, but uh, we will see, uh, we'll see this afternoon. Most certainly we will. Best of luck, thanks very much. Thank you. One of the most amazing things about being here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed is you never know who you're going to bump into, what you might see from F1 legends like Mark Webber to rugby legends like Martin Johnson. You, it's just all going off, so keep your eyes peeled. And if you do spot something cool, send it over. Drop us a tweet at Foss Goodwood. We've been loving the ones that have been coming in so far. Going to have a quick look at what you've been uh, seeing today. Chris Aldham, he's having a great time uh, there at the BMW range experience. He's having a good time there. Actually, you can do all sorts there. You get to rag it round one of the cars and get up the hills. There's loads of things going there, so it's really cool. Um, we've had loads of tweets coming in, so thank you for sending them all. Thank you to Jason Bird. He's got a great little selfie there. It's a nice sunny day, as you can see, blue skies today. Absolutely glorious. What a wonderful afternoon. Hello to Catherine Hughes, more than a little bit excited to be at Foss Goodwood today. I tell you what, it is so exciting, so much going off, so much going off today. Jay Thomas, oh, hello Nicholas Hamilton. That's one of those surreal moments that can just happen to you, can't you, if you're wandering around. As I say, keep those eyes peeled. You never know, you might get the most epic uh, profile picture. Wendy Nelson, love to the Red Arrows. Aren't they just incredible? Getting that heart with the arrow perfectly through the start and the end of the heart. I don't know how they did it. Unbelievable. Weasel, hello. This event is attaining people all over the world. What a show. Thank you for watching and thank you for tuning in wherever you're watching and wherever you are. It's just been so much fun. Honestly, it's such a fantastic afternoon. As I say, just keep those tweets coming at Foss Goodwood. Use the hashtag Foss and I have them back over now to the commentators. Thank you, Sean. My goodness me, the weather, it's clouding over. I mean, look at that, Barry. About 10 miles away, there's a smallest amount of cotton wool fluffy cloud. That's probably vapour from the Goodwood Festival of Speed, <laughs> I would have thought. Steam coming out of our ears, <laughs> I rather fancy. Yeah, it looks a bit of vapour up there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, do keep in touch with Goodwood through uh, Twitter, through Facebook, through Instagram. Use the hashtag FOS. And also, uh, do download the brand new this week Goodwood app. Go to Google Play or the App Store and you can download uh, the app. Goodwood Jensen Motorsport app. It's called Goodwood Motorsport app. Jensen Button makes his way down towards the start, the turning area at the far end, down by the Goodwood Hotel. I can see Emanuele Pirro. He's down there as well as we have another glimpse of the 2016 championship winning Mercedes Formula One car, the one and a half litre turbocharged hybrid powered machine that we saw in the hands of Valtteri Bottas this morning. Yeah, it's been the most amazing display of Formula One cars up the hill, Toby, up there. I mean, and they, they stop right outside our commentary point here. They do donuts, the revs, unbelievable. We're already on with bike action. And uh, 
Who have we got here? Troy Corsa making his way down to the start line. On his way down. Following a Mercedes, so the BMW 1000 RR. Just going through your shot there. Kind of motorcycle, you know, you take the wing mirrors off, take the number plate off, do put another can on it, and you can do 200 miles an hour. These modern road-going superbikes just to another level. Well, you know, everything is relative, and uh, these little things, we're looking at Stuart Graham, the number 16, carrying the number four on the race bike out of the Honda Museum. In their day, everything was relative, and when they were racing those on the roads, and indeed some of the circuits, the Bruno circuit, for example, down the main straight in period in the 60s, had a bollard in the middle of the main straight with a couple of straw bales around it. You could go either side. Absolutely. Now, you imagine that. Just, um, will I, won't I? You know, either side of that bollard. And when you go further down from the old start line at Bruno, you know, you'd be going through a village downhill, not quite as uh, steep as, as Bray Hill on the Isle of Man, but curb stones and cobblestones and such like. Indeed. A tremendous circuit once it got into the countryside. But, uh, of course, that then all ended in the, uh, in the late 80s. And in 1987, the current Bruno circuit was then, was then built. Well, at that period, the Isle of Man TT being a round of the world championship wasn't such an odd thing because it was a relatively good fit with all the rest of the circuits. But as one by one, the one they got revamped. We've got Matty Griffin on the screen at the moment. The Isle of Man eventually was taken off the Grand Prix calendar. Barry Sheen was very responsible for campaigning that, just as Jackie Stewart did for safety in the Formula One world. Uh, Barry Sheen was the big noise and the big voice behind getting the Isle of Man removed from the world championship calendar to go there by choice and race is one thing to go there because you need points to win the championship with your back against the wall different ball game i would have thought he was and i think he you know his decision was absolutely the right thing so many men unfortunately came to grief on road races in quest of world championship points the bike's then under the trees down at the starting area, a bit of relief from the sun. You can see the Puma Sprinter there on the right-hand side. Uh, just, under, just under 1,600 cc, just under 1,600 horsepower. Good grief. Methanol, pure methanol, nitromethanol, I would imagine. Nitromethane in there, and uh, a quick, quick bike indeed, Ian King's bike. And I see them every day when I go back up to the top of the paddock on my way out they have that engine stripped, so it's almost like, I won't say it's a complete rebuild, but it needs to be taken to pieces every run. Piston rings per mile, is that how they calculate yeah, the I, fuel I would, consumption? I would imagine it's something like that. I do know that running sprint cars, drag cars and methanol fuel races is an extremely expensive business. Stuart Graham sitting there under the cool, as you say, Barry. I look out of our commentary position. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome here to the Goodwood Festival of Speed. It's just coming up to half past two here in the south of England. If you're watching on our live stream around the world, wherever you may be, it is a beautiful, perfect, scorching hot day. Temperatures approaching some 29, even 30 degrees Celsius here at the moment. Make sure you've got your sun cream on make sure you've got enough water close by we have still got the motorcycles to come up then the hark back to the old days of formula one through the 70s the 80s then bringing us up completely up to date as you saw a moment ago with the mercedes amg formula one car back from 2016 and uh, in about an hour and a half time or so we'll be looking forward to the 2018 goodwood festival of speed shootout will roman dumas be able to convert his pole position, if I can call it that, his fastest qualifying time that he did yesterday for the shootout of a 43.05 second run into being the best time of the weekend, the victorious run of 2018 here at Goodwood. Second quickest in qualifying was Peter Dumbreck. Third quickest was Jeremy Smith in the Indianapolis 500 winning Penske from 1993. Roman Damas in the Pikes Peak brand new record holding car the Volkswagen IDR and likewise Peter Dumbreck in the Neo EP9 he is some 500, 600 kilos heavier than Roman Dumas's VW. He loses the time when he accelerates off the line, does Dumbreck, but he never loses any more time 
from the end of the avenue of trees, then all the way to the top of the hill. It's just moving that mass of the Neo compared with the much lighter VW. Well, you can see the safety cars down there now and the bikes lining up under the shade along the bottom of the screen. Bikes, Cosworth Turbo, Contemporary F1, all of those things coming up. My, my role within this grand organization is to describe to you in my very best terms the action of the bikes, hopefully imparting a bit of the history of the bikes and talking about a bike with history. There is that factory Honda, the RC146, an inline four-cylinder 125cc with Stuart Graham on board. Honda actually built a five-cylinder 125, which Luigi Taveri campaigned and won a couple of Grand Prix races on. Uh, the pistons, if you can imagine the size of a 125 piston, and, uh, being a, about the diameter of a golf ball, I would have thought. Then divide that by four, and then you think how big each of those four pistons were. Take it even further, divide it by five, they would be about the size of your index finger. And that is, and five of those revving to 21 and a half thousand would have been the makeup of the engine that Luigi Taveri had. This one revs to about 18, and uh, it's the property, it's the original real deal. It's the property of Honda in their museum in Motegi, and they've brought it over here along with one of their irreplaceable Formula One cars. In the day, it would have been a running bump. He would have run along and bumped on it sideways. But you could already hear it. It will be Stuart Graham on the RC146 with its skinny, skinny tyres first away up the hill. And Stuart Graham, so diminutive, so slim, he's kept his figure, his shape. He can still get into his original racing levels. And there aren't many, Toby, racing motorcycles in their seven foot cycles in their centers who can say that. Uh, certainly not Barry Nutley. Stuart Graham on the hill with this tiny little Honda. The most amazing one was the 12-speed Crider. That was something sensational. We're following Stuart Graham right to the top of the hill. And it's a wonderful, wonderful sight. Does that bike look as old as it is? 1965. Does it look it? Of course it doesn't. It looks absolutely amazing. Honda were experts at the time of looking at other people's technology, refining it, and then doing their own thing. We've got the flat trackers here as well, celebrating the battles that happen on the dirt ovals, uh, the tracks, the jumps, and the road circuits of the AMA flat track series. We've got Brad Baker about to come up in the meantime, talking about flat track from Louisiana here to Goodwood. It is fast, Freddie Spencer. On the RGV 500V, two times the uh, world champion, well, three times, three championships, two of them in the same year in 1985. Freddie Spencer, who is now resident in the UK and very much an ambassador for motorcycle news. He's around here all the time in his familiar Rothmans leathers on that NRS 500, not the factory bike, the RS 500, which is the triple. Here is another Honda. It is the V-twin, the SP1 in the Vimto colors, the growl of the SP1. Prepared for John McGuinness, James Toes own run under Paul Bird Racing, the Vimto bike. There you can see it's number 76. And now Ben and Tom Birchall on track on the 600cc Yamaha R6-powered LCR, the Lewis Christen Racing Chassis, 2009 World Champions, 2017 World Champions, 2016 F2 World Cup Champions, not leading the British, the British or the World Championship this year, so having something of a lull in their career, but they will be at Brands Hatch next weekend in the British Sidecar Championship to try and reclaim some points. Maria Costello on the BMW 1000cc, ridden by four times world champion Pekka Pavarinta and his lady passenger Kersi Kainalainen. 
We've got a whole host of Ducatis here. A 2005 Grand Prix Ducati has gone up the hill that was previously ridden by Loris Caparossi. And we've also got the road bikes here. We've got Randy Mamola going up. Unfortunately, let's not forget that we should be seeing Shane Shaky Burn here today, but he's still recovering well. He was here after yesterday. After his accident, he's not riding the bike, but you caught up with him, Barry. It's great to see him here after such a nasty accident earlier Absolutely. in the year. Absolutely did. The R1, the Yamaha, Andy Canick with Ben Morris on board coming through. And now there's James Hillier. James Hillier on the Quattro Plant JG Speed Fit Kawasaki. James Hillier, probably Kawasaki's best hope of TT success. Uh, and he's, have, he's had strong results in the Isle of Man TT, but he's still got to bring it home for Kawasaki. They're the Foggy Patronus with Ian Simpson on board. Sorry to cut across you, Toby. Not Ian Simpson, 1994 British Superbike champion on the Duckham's Rotary Norton, riding the Foggy Patronus, which was Fogarty and the Malaysia Petroleum Company Patronus's efforts to get into Grand Prix racing. You will have seen that bike many times uh, into World Superbike racing. You'll have seen that bike many times as well. Won some pole positions, did some good results, but never won a race. But it sounded brilliant, because it was a triple. It, was it a sounded triple. absolutely wonderful. Talking about world champions, here is Troy Corsa, two-time world superbike champion. He's with the BMW 1000RR, wheeling his way up towards the flint wall. He's managed to put the front back down on the ground, but soon he's going to get it skyward once more. Always the showman. Always the showman. Here is Gino Ray. Uh, Ray. He is on the forward racing Moto2 bike. Moto2 that replaced the 250cc Grand Prix World Championship, and it's going to be replaced with the 765cc Norton engine in Moto2 next year. Now we go over to Honda, to the Fireblades. Yeah, we've got a couple of Fireblades here. We, we've got We've got uh, Dan Linfoot, who's injured, and Jason O'Halloran, both injured. They're the new Moto2 Triumph 765cc. Triumph will be the engine supplier for Moto2 from 2019. Uh, when Triumph first came back, the boss at the time, John Bloor, said, we're never going to race here. As they grew in their stature, they grew in confidence, they decided they would put a toe in the water. There was a one-make series in the UK, and uh, Triumph now have risen to the exalted heights of being the Moto2, which is just one division below Moto GP. Number 27 there, the RC30. Peter Hickman on board. That's Hickey, ladies and gentlemen. Peter Hickman, the fastest man around the Isle of Man, 135 point, you know what it is. Four, Four miles an hour, yeah. Yeah, very, very, very quick. And here is John McGuinness. So the man in front of him was the first man to break 135, and here is John McGuinness, the first man to break 130 miles an hour. As an average speed, around the 37.73 miles of the Isle of Man course. On the SG7, the Stuart Garner, the seventh version of his race bike, now almost 100% British built. We're back with the flat trackers. We've got Harleys and we've got a completely modern range of Indian bikes built for 2018. Just watch them screech off the line. There we have, watch that, the number 80. Well, that's a Ducati flat tracker. Ducati have come into the scene as well. Number 23, a Harley XR 750 with Jeffrey Carver on board, away from the line. And now, the Husqvarna, the number 69 Husqvarna, a Yamaha, I beg your pardon, YZ 450. That's Ollie Brindley, son of Derek Brindley, former British sidecar champion. Number 56 is the Mackenzie Boost Yamaha from 19. 98, ridden by Girard uh, Bernard Girardo Migliorani. It's a heck of a mouthful, that. We're looking at all parts of the Goodwood Hill climb, as you can imagine, but these flat trackers, they are doing their starts, they are doing practice starts, and we're here at some of the modern Indians, the 750 twins. Brad the Bullet Baker is here, ladies and gentlemen. And I tell you what, 
Toby, if we move away from our mild hysteria, these Americans are thrilled to be here, aren't they? Here, Absolutely thrilled. Here he is, Brad the Bullet Baker. He went head to head a couple of winters ago in the Super Prestigio back in Barcelona. And I think they're going to do a bit of a, a bit of a race start here, are they? In front of the house. They yes, are. they are. I think they are. Do you want it, folks? Put your hands together for these flat trackers. Come on now. Look this, at that. These, Real control. These are the kind of monocycles that Nicky Hayden started his career on, that uh, Freddie Spencer, Randy Mamola, who's here today as well. King Kenny Roberts, three times a world champion. They all started on the flat tracking bikes. I think they are one of the highlights on two wheels this year. There goes the Puma, the Ian King drag bike. Absolutely unbelievable. Methanol fuel, enormously fat. It will be a good year, rear slick, I'm sure, because it's taken straight from the world of drag racing. Goodyear still manufacture tires for NASCAR. In fact, it, I believe it's an Avon. No, it's not. It, it's a good year. It's a good year MT. Here we go then. A great plume of smoke squirts it in a straight line on the right sort of runway in the right sort of conditions. That projectile is capable of getting to 100 miles an hour in under two seconds. That's quick by any stretch of the imagination. Watch the tire grow. The center of the tire raises by about two inches, so the whole thing increases in diameter. The back of the bike rises up. He's going to do another start for you. Just watch it. Watch the back go up. The tire grows. There it goes. Pops up in the air, and away he goes. It's only good in a straight line, but my goodness me, it's entertaining stuff. Now, from Galway on the west coast of Ireland, Matty Griffin, our BMW stunt rider who has been riding the mark for six years at least, something of an ambassador for BMW. While Ian King still does his thing on the drag bike. Just so much wonderful motorcycle activity. Put your hands together for Matty Griffin, Ian King, and all the boys, ladies and gentlemen. They have had three days of absolute enjoyment here, thrilling us and entertaining the crowds at the 25th anniversary Festival of Speed here at Goodwood. Matty Griffin then. And you'll notice he's just wearing soft shoes. He doesn't wear a motorcycle boot. He wears, <laughs> he wears a deck shoe because he can't possibly be nimble. He can't hop from the seat oh, I see. to the tank. He's not insanity. Uh, no. no. It, just so he's got deck shoes on. He, he'll hop up on the seat in a minute. He skips about. And, uh, you know, he's not done this without injury, I can tell you. He's mm. had one or two offs. But there with the foot down on the tailpiece, a tight pirouette. How good is that? Come on, everyone. Big round of applause for Matty Griffin in front of Goodwood House. He has been great value all weekend. That is going to be our last look at the bikes. Sob, sob. Uh, so uh, give him a big cheer once he's done. And again, Barry, the precision, the balance to do all of this, it is breathtaking. That bike is on a fine edge, balancing, there's no <laughs> doubt. David Addison has rejoined me in the commentary box. Toby Moody uh, having a little bit of walkabout and going to do some stuff for TV, I suspect. Uh, Matty then on his way up the track. I thoroughly enjoyed my time here this weekend talking to you about the two-wheel activity. We move on, of course, from here to Revival later in the summer in September, and we're all looking forward desperately to that. I've attended many, I guess possibly 18 of the Festivals of Speed, certainly 15. I have never, David, seen weather like this over the three days, the four days even. Yeah, it's been never. astonishing. It's been absolutely amazing. Well, if we're going to have it for any of the festivals of speed, then the Silver Jubilee one is the year, isn't it? But uh, everybody from the two-wheel branch of the sport has given their all this weekend. We've had some great exhibitions. And Matty Griffin, everybody, has been another star of this year's Goodwood Festival of Speed, presented by MasterCard. Well done, Matty. Thank you so much for all the entertainment this weekend. And Barry Nutley, thank you as well for My guiding pleasure. us through the two-wheel side. You'll hear more from Barry later in the afternoon on Radio Goodwood because uh, once we're off air and the hill has closed, Radio Goodwood for another couple of hours uh, will be uh, entertaining us. Now, we've got the uh, Formula One cars still to come, and then we're going to have Jetpack Man, which is going to be well worth watching as well, fingers crossed, because that is the plan. But before all of that, we're going to have Jensen Button making his way up towards the line. Thank you.
So I think the intention is that we'll go through the cars and then we'll get to Jetpack Land. This is Jensen Button, uh, of course, the 2009 Formula One world champion. He drives the Honda RA301. Uh, Jensen, I think, of all the modern day Formula One drivers, is the one that's been to more festivals of speed than anybody else. And this is here to celebrate, in part, 60 years of Lola. It was a development of the previous season's RA300. It's a car from 1968. It had this Lola design monocoque. Uh, and it was fast, but it wasn't a winner. Second in the French Grand Prix for John Surtees was the best result. And then Honda withdrew at the end of the year. They came back, of course, as an engine provider, back again as a constructor. That away, back again with engines. And it's not been an easy time over the last few years with McLaren and then STR. Then we have the Lotus 49, a car that was not only a great shape, but it also, Chris Drew, it revolutionized the look of the sport because this with the gold leaf colors was really the first external sponsorship from, from non-trade suppliers, if you like. Yeah, as David had launched the fabulous Cosworth DFV, which yeah. went on to win so many races. Bolted onto the back of the chassis, the first time back of the Monaco, first time Chapman had done that, didn't have an engine frame. The, the DFP was strong enough to hold the, the rear suspension. So the car you've just seen, an ex-Jim Clark, Graham Hill, Lock and Rin, Jackie Oliver, chassis this, the Ferrari 312 B3. Started life as a short wheelbase car, it's Nicky Lauda's Spanish Grand Prix winning car. And another car that moved the goalposts, courtesy of Lotus, was this, the 79 from 1978, Mario Andretti's championship winning car but sadly also the type of car in which the great Ronnie Peterson lost his life. Yeah, Mario said it's like being painted to the road. Yes, real so. first tunnel down for us. He has a skirt, sucked the car to the ground. Yep. Brabham came out with a fan car to try and combat it. A year earlier, Renault thought, but good idea here, we'll get all this power out of a turbocharged one and a half litre engine. It came to Silverstone rather than being launched at the French Grand Prix for fear of embarrassment. And as it became known, the yellow teapot popped and whistled and smoked and steamed its way in and out of the pit lane. And now turbo technology is a given. And they got it right in the end, and René Arnoux is driving it. That's right, it was Jean-Pierre Jabouille that gave Renault its first win, but that didn't come until 79 in the later car. René Arnoux was part of the Renault F1 team. He'd come out of the Martini driver programme. Uh, you'll see here, from 1983, the car that should have been the World Championship winning car, but Renault got a bit complacent, didn't listen to Alain Prost's motivation by saying, look, we're being caught. Brabham and BMW have got more power. They're getting quick on pit stops now, because they were introduced by Bernie Eccleston and Gordon Murray that year. We're going to lose this. No, no, said Renault, it'll be fine. And they lost, but that was a great car in its time. And this, with Renault Power, the Lotus, the very car with which Ayrton Senna won the 1985 very wet Portuguese Grand Prix. And things were never the same again after that either. No, that's right. He was visibly quicker in on that wet track than anybody else. He, and, and took different lines around the corners, realised that there was much more grip around the outside than this is a car that takes you to the end of 85 into 86. It's the Lola Haas. It was sponsored by Beatrice, this American conglomerate. It tempted back Alan Jones. Eddie Cheever drove one. Patrick Tombe was saddled with it for 1986. On paper, it should have worked. Good chassis. Lots of clever people behind it. Big budget. It was a bit of a disaster, sad to say. It was. Well, it was pretty. Little Ford V6 in the back. It's right, yeah. Whereas this, which was the McLaren Emerson Fittipaldi's championship winning car, the M23. Lando Norris behind the wheel. Real star of the future here. Nando and George are doing so well in, in GB2, in uh, Formula 2, um, really leading the way. Yes, the future of British drivers, British talent, is certainly safe, that is for certain. Because uh, the pair of them race winners in Formula 2. Now here is a very different sort of McLaren, it's the car that won the 1995 Le Mans 24 hours. Ben Barleycote is behind the wheel of it. Ben is a McLaren factory driver doing great things in GT racing. Axel Cita Gun next to Masanori Sakaya. JJ Lexo, Yannick Dalmas, the winner from 1995 in the wet. And we believe McLaren are working on a, on a supercar with a centre seat again. Which would be great, wouldn't it? Now, you can't keep a good man down, can you? Emmanuel Manny Piro has found himself something to drive, and it is this Tyrrell. I mean, the guy is just an inveterate enthusiast, isn't he? He's one of our team captains at the members' meeting, and always smiling, always enthusiastic. From 1971, the Tyrrell 003, this is Doug Muckett masquerading as John Watson in the car that John won the Austrian Grand Prix with, and then had to shave off his beard. So it was a, a, a beardless Watty after that, that was the bat. From a time Penske were in pool. That's right, yes it was, wasn't yeah. it? Yes. I mean, you associate them with American racing. Yeah. And, and on the one hand, you could 
could say, well, they never really conquered Formula One because they, they arrived and went in a short space of time. But they won a Grand Prix. The team won a Grand Prix, and that's a major achievement. Yep. Made in Dawson. To the flag goes Doug Mockett. Paul Stewart is behind on the hill in Tyrrell 006, the uh, car from 1973. It was driven by his father and uh, Francois Sever, whose uh, very, very sad death at Watkins Glen really had an effect on Sir Jackie. Yeah, he retired very shortly afterwards. He was going to retire at the end of that season, wasn't he? And they elected to not do that race. Was, am I right in saying that instead of him bowing out on 100 races, it became 99? Because he didn't do that American Grand Prix no. in respect, and therefore it was 99 on which he stayed. Yeah. And uh, a wave to acknowledge that from Paul Stewart, who of course uh, ran with his father, the Stewart Grand Prix team, but was no mean racing driver himself. Jackie himself was here yesterday. Driving Tyrrells, driving Lexus 25s. Here is from a later era, uh, not as the programme will tell you at, at Toyota, TF108 is the earlier 105 My Gascoigne design car for Jano Trulli. Ralph Schumacher drove it until he had a big accident at Indianapolis, so Ricardo Zonta took over for the rest of the season. But Toyota never made it. They put in a huge investment from time and effort. They were based in Germany, which maybe didn't help, um, so they never quite made it. But they wanted for nothing. You know, budget was there, engineers were there, drivers were there, results weren't there. Everything should have fitted together. Not a new young driver, Jack Aitken, starring in uh, GP2. He is a Renault Junior driver. This the ex Kimi Raikkonen, Abu Dhabi winning car, the Lotus E20. It's in a different colour scheme now, but Jack Aitken not thinking about a time. He's just thinking about entertaining. And this is what a car of the period back in 2012 sounds like. Not thinking much about the gearbox. <laughs> Now, what about Ferrari? No festival of speed would be complete without the shrill shriek of a modern-day Ferrari heading up the hill, and we are about to enjoy this one because Marc Genet is on the hill. And Jack Aitken still doing nothing near the paddock. We're all coughing around here. Emerges from the smoke and up to welcome. I love seeing these new young drivers having fun in the F1 crowd. Because this is the place they let off the leash. Uh, it's not a 3-1-2-T, this, but it is Marc Genet at the wheel of the F60, making his way up the hill now. Mark, who's become very much part of the Ferrari test programme, but again, go back a decade or so, you know, he was a very, very quick single-seater driver in his own right, the Spanish driver. And these cars can't go for a time, but you appreciate just how fast they are. Greg Baracci with another of the F-150s to go up the hill. It's nice when uh, F-1 gets back to making a good noise. Yes, and there are moves to do it, aren't there? Yeah, I hope so. It's uh, been interesting this last week at the British Grand Prix to go from a Formula 1 session to the Formula 2 race, where the sound is completely different. And, you, know, you can see people just, just step back towards the barriers, just look up again, what's this? Because yeah. it sounds fast, and that's what appeals to people. Well, we've had everything from sights and sounds, smells, you name it, here at the Festival of Speed. Here is Patrick Friesacker, the very same, but was doing great things with the uh, NASCAR. The day and here in the Red Bull with the Renault engine, the RB8, the Sebastian Vettel uh, winning car from 2012. I can't promise you he's going to do donuts quite as colourfully as he did in the NASCAR, but you know that Patrick is a showman, and here comes another helping of donuts for you in front of Goodwood House. It's no way to treat a Formula One title winning car, is it? Well, here anything goes. Patrick Friesacker, everybody in the Red Bull Renault. Don't get penalised for wrecking the gearbox. <laughs> Changing the gearbox. It's the last day. Yeah, no template grid drop for that. You're yeah, absolutely yeah, right. That's right. It's the last day of the festival. It's a chance to say goodbye and say goodbye in style for these drivers who have entertained us all so royally this weekend. And look at this. An absolutely magnificent car going back to the mid-1970s. It is Giacomo Casoli uh, driving the 312T, the sort of car that uh, Nicky Lauda won five Grand Prix with in 1970. 75 to win the World Championship yeah, with the flat 12 engine. So aerodynamically, from a downforce point of view, not as effective as the Lotus because, of course, the engine was much wider. Tunnels couldn't be quite so wide, but bring, we're getting nearer to the current era. Because this is Valtteri Bottas now aboard the Mercedes-Benz F1 
One W07 Hybrid. Uh, Valtteri, who's had a really unlucky season in Formula One, but this car, going back to 2016, it's the Nico Rosberg Championship winning car. Uh, Valtteri, very, very rapid driver. You're not really seeing the best of him this season, but surely he is a man with some more wins in him for this season. He's going to do what he can for donuts in this car. Of course, one of the problems in a modern F1 car is it's got all the tricks on to stop you sliding and spinning, so you've got to really work hard to start doing donuts. Yeah, I don't know if there's an off switch. <laughs> I think Valtteri will just do a launch, shall we? Let's see. It's going to try and flick it sideways. The controls on the steering column, uh, steering wheel are so complex. How are these oh, yes. guys race them and, and handle all that? So Valtteri Bottas lights up the tyres, leaves 11s on the road. And in 2016, Mercedes, a, a dominant car, 19 wins from 21 races between Nico Rosberg and Lewis Hamilton that year in this car. And as he makes his way up towards the crossing, now we found the space for some donuts. Ladies and gentlemen, Valtteri Bottas. And somewhere in all of the tar smoke, there should be yeah. a Mercedes. How does he know which round of applause for how, Valtteri. How does he know which way to come up? <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's a Grand Prix driver and we're not. Yeah, exactly. Now out of Malcolm Corner, ladies and gentlemen, Valtteri Bottas brings away the F1 demo to a close, but he might just do another launch start for you here. They do practice starts, of course, at the end of each practice session at a modern-day Grand Prix. Uh, this is another excuse just to light up the tyres here. But at a real Grand Prix, he want, wouldn't want as much wheel spin as that. No, if you think about the Austrian Grand Prix last year, where his start was so good it had to be investigated, uh, he is a master of them. And what about Mads Osberg? He is in the Citroen C3 WRC. Mads has had a really busy weekend. He's been up on the rally stage. He's been back down here. And uh, he's going to entertain us as well at the end of this batch. And then, all being well, we're going to have something extraordinary for you to look at. Here is Mads Osberg. And uh, here is the Citroen powering its way to the top of the hill. Citroen's had a bit of a yo-yo time in the World Rally Championship of late. Good season, bad season, good season, bad season. But what it does prove is that the WRC is a very fierce competition once more. And if you think race cars are spectacular going up the hill climb here a car set up for a forest rally stage doing an all tarmac run it's pretty spectacular too so great start from Matt Osberg if that's whetted your appetite for rallying uh, the rally stage is busy all afternoon but at the very top of the hill ready to talk to some of the stars of that last batch is Bruce Jones so, the last F1 batch of the meeting, and uh, Jack Aitken, have you had fun over the days in the Renault? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've been trying to put on a good show for all the fans, do a few donuts and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, this bit... <laughs> Mads is ruining my interview. <laughs> You're lucky it's not the drifters. Yeah, no, he's doing a good job. Um, yeah, we try and put on a good show, that's what it's all about. No, it really is. Glad you've enjoyed it. I'm just going to move across from your Renault Formula 1 car to a car that says F1, but it's the McLaren F1 GTR, the sports car that put McLaren on the map. They went to this little race in France, the Le Mans 24 hours, and Ben Barnicote, uh, <laughs> you're handling a lot of history. They turn, McLaren turns up at Le Mans in 1995 and wins first time out. Yeah, I mean, uh, as you said, to win it first time and try in um, was an incredible achievement, which, you know, is why this car is, uh, you know, so prestigious to the brand. And it wasn't a car that was ever really intended to race, but Gordon Murray, the designer, went, well, why not? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, when you read the story about it, it's incredible what short space of time they had to prepare for the event. But, you know, it clearly the car showed what it's capable of and was able to win that race the first time of trying. And it just shows what an incredible road car they were able to build. Well, in that way, it was effectively the first modern era McLaren road car. It launched seemingly one new model per month at the moment. So it laid the foundations. Great car. Glad you've enjoyed it. But uh, hey, when you drove it for the first time, was it a little bit scary with all that history? Yeah, you know, they instructed me to make sure I looked after it. But you know, every run after been going a little bit quicker, a little bit quicker. It's an amazing car to drive. For a 1995 car, I can't believe how advanced it is. Absolutely brilliant. And I had the biggest smile on my face all weekend. Good stuff. That big BMW V12 in the back. No wonder you're smiling. So that was Ben Barnicut. Just take a look inside the car, though. Central driving position. Room for the shopping and the golf clubs. But far more than that, very, very quick indeed. Just going to walk on up the hill. There's Valtteri Bottas has just come up. If I could just interrupt this conversation just for a second. What, Mark Janay, 
a bright sunny afternoon. You've been such a stalwart of the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Great to have you here again. Yeah, it's always nice to see Ferrari coming to Goodwood with the Formula One car. And, you know, it's been now many years. I know the track very well, of course, and I just try to put a good show and show the speed the Formula One car can do. One thing that people always love, is, just, apart from me in the middle of an interview, is just the sound of these engines really being given, showing, showing their beautiful notes. It's the only thing, I mean, I like a lot uh, Valtteri to be here with a hybrid car, but I think nothing can beat the V8, V10, V12 sounds of Formula One cars. You know, they just sound is pure music. And that's why when I ro go up the hill, I just try to rev them to the maximum revs, go through all the gears, I go up to fifth gear. Uh, we're doing a top speed here, it's close to 250 at the end of the start and finish, but because I want people to hear the sound, the scream of these uh, amazing engines. Exactly so, so do we. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So I'm sorry, sorry, I beg pardon, tripping over people as, as I leave. And I'm just going up the hill, the person who made a huge amount of noise, Patrick Friesacker. Sometimes in a NASCAR, sometimes in a Red Bull Formula One car, but this car, the RB8, really was fantastic for Red Bull because, of course, Sebastian Vettel took that late, late championship victory and it laid the history for all the years that followed. Yeah, it has big history and for me it's a great pleasure to drive that car up the hill here, and especially at Goodwood. And like I did this year with two cars, it's just mega. The weather is great, the people out there love it. So every year I really love to come over here. Yeah, well, we love having you always entertain us, and it's, it's always quite sad when you get to the Sunday afternoon. It's over for another year. Yeah, that's right. So I'm going to be back next year, for sure. Excellent. Thanks very much. So that's it from the top of the hill. The last sighting of the Formula One cars come back in 12 months' time. We certainly will be here. And so we are going to very shortly uh, have uh, something uh, fairly spectacular on the hill, but also uh, we are about to enjoy something very special at Goodwood House. It uh, is going to be well worth your while heading there because in about five to ten minutes, um, a British Formula One world champion will be at Goodwood House. You've seen him on the hill already. And uh, so... Uh, Jensen Button is going to be on the balcony of Goodwood House and uh, it's going to be something to savour, I promise you. There is Goodwood House uh, and uh, that is where JB is going to be very, very shortly indeed. Still plenty more to come before we get to that. And uh, there's a steel plate on the track uh, which might give you a clue that we're going to have something sensational. It's been one of the sensations of this year's Goodwood Festival of Speed. Shall we give the game away, David, or shall we wait till there's a bit of a surprise? Well, I'm still kind of hoping that, that everything goes according to plan, but yeah, I hate to preempt it and it all go wrong, but yes, let's talk about it, I'll because give you a clue. It, it is something exciting. Yeah, we're not looking on the ground, we're looking in the air, not very high, 30, 30 feet or so, and we'll see something absolutely spectacular. This is David Mayman, our jetpack pilot, who uh, straps on the jetpack, which he has spent 11 years developing, developing and um, the jetpack has six little turbine engines there he is there's David on the steel plate that's for protecting the uh, surface here at, uh, at the first corner said Gore actually and he could fly on four engines here at Goodwood he is actually using all six and he could fly at up to 200 miles an hour and up to 10,000 feet. Although I talked to him yesterday, I said, surely, David, by the time you get to 10,000 feet, you run out of fuel. He said, yeah, which is embarrassing. Um, he does have a lot of warning. When he's down to a minute of fuel, he gets lots of red lights. Right hand controls the throttle. Left hand controls your, in other words, change of direction. For forward, it's like a helicopter to push the handlebars forward and then pull back to stop. You'll see that in much more vivid illustration when David takes off. It's been certified by the Federal Aviation Authority in the States and of course the market is going to be primarily military and uh, the, the US Navy is definitely ir Ill interested in the jetpack as a way of getting people from here to there quickly when they don't have to worry about noise because of course as you're here no doubt and are already hearing you can't call it a stealth machine it makes a lot of noise and a lot of smell but it is the most stunning thing to watch david takes off applies power rotates with his left hand 
plenty of throttle to lift it up in the air and leans a little bit forward to get some forward motion and he will if it's what he's done before fly under the bridge mostly because he's not allowed to fly over the bridge in case he sets it on fire as you've about it there's a lot of hot jet exhaust under yep He's not going to damage the tarmac when he flies at speed over the top of it, but coming into land or taking off, there is a danger that he could put little pits in the Goodwood tarmac. Now he's building up speed, going towards the bridge, and under the bridge. Sensational if you're standing on the bridge from a noise point of view, you won't see him underneath you. And then he's coming closer to us here at Molecombe, Give him a wave, give him a cheer. Of course, he's concentrating on what he's doing, but he can see what's going on on the ground. Up to Morecambe, through the trees, he'll turn around and come back. David Mayman is an Australian, lives in San Diego. Has invested a huge amount of capital every camera phone at goodwood <laughs> yeah. chris is trained on this down yeah, here i wonder if we can get a camera <laughs> on the crowd because every camera phone at, Gil at goodwood is focusing on Je david bayman our jetpack man <laughs> it is sensational now of course the fire truck is following him down to the landing pad he's working on uh, the a two turbine version which actually was the earlier one but he flies that but only over water he won't fly the two turbine one over land because of course if one turbine fails then uh, it's awkward but with the six turbines if one of them fails there's very clever electronics that adjust the other five to keep it stable hovering look at that uh, jerry judah structure and the jetpack it's just sensational and as somebody said this morning in 25 years time we'll all be coming here on our jetpacks that's right absolutely probably be anti-gravity <laughs> but this is a first you saw the guy at paul ricard in the french grand prix different technology altogether mm -hmm. and uh, not with the same uses for military for search and rescue for medical as this jetpack has in the future. But just going back to that military um, potential use, it, it's something like this, I guess, is not quite stealth. It's not going to avoid a radar. You'd still detect it, but it could get you into places that otherwise you couldn't get. Yeah. As long as it's not too far away, you've only got between 8 and 12 minutes. For now. <laughs> For now, yes. So David lands on the steel plate, and the thing weighs about 50 kilos, uh, which is about a Royal Marines backpack, isn't it? So you can function. As you'll see, David will walk back to his base and then the he'll hook the jetpack onto a cradle unbuckle himself and then he's free to walk back and david loves it to if you wander down and talk to him he's got a tent just uh, on the outside of the circuit outside the second corner and he'll be down there and uh, as i saw yesterday when i spoke to him he loves chatting to people showing them the the jetpack how about that and now that he can hear you because the noise has stopped how about a round of applause for jetpack man for david mayman absolutely astonishing if you've been watching that on the live stream do not adjust your set that was real there is jensen button who is at the uh, top of the hill we're going to get him down to goodwood house very shortly because now that jetpack man has done the cars are going to be brought back and jb will be ready uh, to go uh, to the top of the house and uh, something very special is coming up it was a very special year when jensen won the world championship for braun the team of course was born not brawn out of honda uh, Honda had said enough is enough and Ross Braun found the money he had to make people redundant but he kept the team going but because of all the work they'd done the previous season with the new regulations he came out of the gates 
really on the right foot and the first part of the season was just so good for Jensen Button. Rubens Barrichello is his teammate won races as well and although the opposition caught up and the win rate dwindled towards the end of the season there was enough in hand the results were still there to give him a world championship title. Get a head start and they have to catch you by being better all the time exactly. that's really where Braun uh, made that championship happen isn't it? Yeah. And the irony that we later discovered during that season was that the double diffuser, which was the key element of the Braun GP car that nobody else really had sorted out, Ross Braun had flagged up as a personal, a, a, a possible area of development that maybe the FIA ought to look at closing down. Mm. And everybody went, no, that's not going to work. That doesn't work. OK, right, fair enough. You don't mind if I try, then? You know, exactly. And then, oh, dear, hang on a minute. Yes, apparently it was worthwhile. I mean, Jensen Button, after years of struggling a little bit with some of the Honda cars, when he drove the Braun for the very first time in the first test, just kind of got out and had a chat, was quite relaxed about it, until they told him how quickly he'd gone. Mm. And then, I think, the whistle of the penny dropping from a very yeah, great yeah, height yeah, began. Yeah. And yes, what a, a, what, a, what, a, what a season that was. It was a car virtually devoid of sponsorship. You know, mm -hmm. it was not hand to mouth, but you know, it was a limited budget compared to what Honda would have put in, what Mercedes puts yeah. in now as examples. But well, he came to the race of champions at the end of the previous winter, and he was talking about the team from Brackley. Hopefully, hopefully we're going to stay together. Hopefully we're going to find a budget. Hopefully we're going to find an engine. Hopefully, hopefully. And in the end, all the hopes and dreams that they couldn't possibly have had over the winter was about trying not to lose everybody's jobs, ended up with the, the ultimate season of his career. Absolutely right, because prior to that, he'd been in good teams, but not at good times. He'd yeah. been at Williams in his first season, which was an OK debut year, but then he went to the Benetton-Renault element of his career, and, and the cars were good at the wrong times or he wasn't able to get the best out of them yeah. and the relationship between Jensen and Flavio Briatore was not a great one and there were some rather derogatory remarks by Flav about him for a time but uh, Jensen when he went to Honda knuckled down he got a win of course at the Hagara ring <laughs> see you man really doing hand signals there three two one let's go let's go He's here. you want to race son well, we know who's the star of this next parade down the hill, and everybody at the foot of Goodwood House is there to receive him. So it's only right that Jensen goes first. And in fact, those of you lining the fence by the hill climb course, turn around and come back to the coach turning mm. circle because Jensen is going into the coach turning circle there in front of Goodwood House to have a chat for you. And while that happens, the rest of the hill climb course will be quiet. So if you're anywhere near the house, hustle over. And we've uh, have a word with Jensen Button. We've got the sports racing cars going down to the start line, ready for our next batch, building up towards the shootout coming up in just under an hour's time. But of course now, once you've been to the top of the hill, you come down it the wrong way, and therefore we'll have the officials' cars and you'll have the competing cars in line behind them. And it's going to be led, of course, this parade down the hill by Jensen Button. Yeah, Jensen, getting ready to chat to Mark Weber. It's hard to come down the hill the right way. It is the right way. You said come down the hill the wrong way. Yeah, I, I, I know where you were going with that, but that was another bus coming. The right I'm way. I'm fully invigorated. I've, ha I've had a chocolate bar full of nuts. So, Jensen Button then, Formula One world champion, now Super GT racer, sports car racer. And uh, last week he was at Silverstone demonstrating the... Uh, six-wheel Williams that we have also seen on the hill over the course of the weekend. He'll make his way past Flint Wall and those of you lining the hill climb uh, in a moment when he comes back towards the grandstands, give him a great reception. Arm out of the cockpit and ladies and gentlemen, Jensen Button, Formula One world champion in the Honda the Hondola, as it was called, the Honda based on a Lola chassis, but one of Britain's great Formula One drivers makes his way through Malcolm Corner to a great reception, and we'd like you to be just as noisy in a few minutes' time once he makes his way onto the balcony of Goodwill House. And uh, as the rest of the cars come through behind, you've got the next batch going to the start line. Yeah. Jensen's going to be waved into the approach of the house and then we'll be able to cross over and hear from a man that has been a regular fixture here at the... 
many years, he barely keeps away because he just loves it. Everybody else that has now finished their final run up the hill in the F1 machinery, including Valtteri Bottas lining up the tyres, uh, Jack Aitken likewise making the most of this final run down the hill. And to lots of applause, Jensen Button arrives at the foot of Goodwood House and will make his way shortly to his uh, allotted parking slot. And then the car will be to the millimetre placed exactly where it needs to be. Tremendous to see so many of you there to receive one of Britain's Formula One world champions. Not in this car, we may well find ourselves celebrating Braun in 12 months time at the Festival of Speed. But for now, the car stops and out gets the 2009 Formula One world champion. Ladies and gentlemen, Jensen Button. A great reception. And the Duke of Richmond is there personally to greet you. You know you've made it when the Duke starts the applause, a handshake. Jensen Button, everybody! Not only the applause as a soundtrack, but also Formula One engines as well. It's just done properly, isn't it? Jensen will go to the balcony, and we'll be ready in a few moments to hear uh, from him. As what a backdrop this. Porsche's 70th anniversary. We're remembering a Formula One world champion and hearing from him. There are anniversaries of touring car championships, of Ford Escorts, of Lola. The list goes on and on and on and on over the weekend. Well, it was a very special season, and it's a great shame that we don't have Jensen still in Formula One, but he elected to stand down. Still great to see him competing in other championships. It was great to have him at Le Mans this year, and even though the car let him down very early on, they got it back into the race. The competitive spirit was undimmed. Uh, and he was still there as long as the car would last, still turning in the lap times and still savouring his first experience of Le Mans from behind the wheel. And uh, he will make his way now up the steps. The next batch of cars takes us through sports car racing and the drift guys are going to be back for their last hurrah. In fact, they've started already. Uh, <laughs> In front of Goodwood House, there are more donuts to do. So there, down towards the uh, bottom of the hill goes the Drift Kings for the next batch. And uh, we will now receive onto the balcony Jensen Button with Mark Webber. Jensen Button, one of your. We've got some donuts going on over there, but. He's going the wrong way now, but one of your favourite motorsport sons is with us, Jensen Button. He's been here. He's missed one Goodwood in the last 18 years. Isn't that impressive? Unbelievable. I think Jackie Stewart's only been to more. But JB, this is a pretty special little piece of kit to bring around to the front of the house, isn't it? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I want to be down there. Look, they've got champagne. Free champagne. I mean, it's just the best thing ever. Today's the best day ever. <laughs> Someone had a late night last night, by the way, so he is driving it straight, but he's, he's here to go. I'll tell you why he knows that, because I saw him at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is... Uh, Goodwood's always spectacular, and it just seems to get better and better every year. And, you know, we're, we're so lucky and privileged to drive cars like this beauty down here. Um, it's the most stunning car, and it's actually really emotional when you, dr when you drive it, you know, because you know the history, and uh, the late John Surtees was, uh, you know, did very well in this car, so it's uh, a real privilege to, to take, the, you know, the controls. No question about that, mate. What are you up to now? Let's, um, I mean, you had a little bit of a dabble on the weekend on TV, which was really cool, uh, and in terms of everything else, you're still racing, clearly. You got Le Mans this year, which, you know, how was that, first of all? How was Le Mans? Le Mans was, was a lot of fun, you know, it's, uh, it's always been a dream to do Le Mans and it's, it's always been tricky, with, obviously with F1, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a funny year because you only have one manufacturer, but in terms of a WEC as a series, it's fantastic, and Le Mans is something so special. If you ever get the chance, you've got to go there. To be, just be a part of the atmosphere is, uh, is something that you, you definitely won't regret. And he is 
flying in Japan also, in terms of not flying, but literally he's over there a lot, but he's racing and doing super well in the GT Championship too, mate, right? So run us through that one. Yeah, it's good. The Super GT is it's, uh, it's very different to what I'm used to, but I'm um, racing for Honda there, and it's, uh, it's a really fun category. Lots of great drivers. Well, Heike Kovalainen is there, and Kamui Kobayashi, Nakajima, who's just won Le Mans, which is pretty awesome. So um, really enjoying it, but, you know, back to here. I think this is the most perfect day for this. You look at the weather. The atmosphere is awesome. It's, you know, thank you for all the pink flags. Obviously, every one of you thought of that individually, which is fantastic. Uh, so thank you to those people that made those, those pink flags. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we're just here to celebrate, I think, motorsport in general and, uh, and Goodwood being such a special place for us all to enjoy the history of, of motorsport, whether it's two wheels or four wheels and, uh, and so many spectacular talents as well. You're right, mate. I couldn't have summed it up any better. It is the best motorsport event in the world, no question about it. And the link to two and four wheels, obviously, with John Surtees there. So I'm a bit of a two-wheel nutter as well, so I love seeing the, the two-wheel cars here. Um, and spending a bit more time in America now, mate, so you're over there a bit more with, with Brittany, your fiancé. Um, I know the invites are coming out. The wedding is it's due to come in. I think they've just picking a location, but the invites will be out soon. Um, so just, just go through the normal mailbox. With the, um, I was going to just throw them off the balcony, actually. There we go, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Duke of Richmond, he's so well organised. He runs this event, so he is going to also um, pull Jensen's wedding together as well. So um, we've just delegated that quite well. Um, you, you cool with that, Duke of Richmond? Run Jensen's wedding, you can do that? Yes, he said yes. He said yes. He's up for that. So, uh, so the America, good fun over there, mate? It is. It's, um, you know, I've always wanted to, you know, to spend time in the States and California. I absolutely love. But the main reason uh, is because of my wonderful fiancé that I'm there. So, oh. oh, thank you. It, it, I must say, only just got up because she was so hungover from last night. But uh... <laughs> He's a bad influence, isn't he? He's a bad influence. Well, we must say, as Jensen wrapped it up there, it, it's an incredible event. We want to thank everyone for coming here. I must say that uh, I thoroughly enjoy coming in here every year. It is simply, simply world class. It's a 25th Jubilee this year. Thank you all for coming. It was potentially a football weekend. It's not now. So we're motorsport. We've got petrol in our veins. Thanks very much for coming. We've got the Duke of Richmond here. Yes. And we're going to have a quick chat to Ross Braun as well. Ross, um, here we go. Of course, they won the World Championship together back in 2009 with the, with the, with the Braun weapon of a car that actually kicked our ass that year unfortunately so that was a bit of a bitter pill but Ross what was he like to work with and the emotions around you know the memories around that that title in 2009 well I think everyone everyone who's in Formula One is an exceptional driver and then the styles are different and Jensen was one of the smoothest uh, cleanest drivers I'd ever worked with he was very very fast what I loved about him is he was very honest as well. If there was ever a problem and he'd caused it, he'd admit it. And the team never wasted a moment looking for things that didn't exist because he was as hard on himself as anyone. Uh, and when it came down to it and the opportunity came in 2009, he showed he was one of the best. And uh, I remember Brazil 2009, we'd had a bit of a shaky qualifying and he came in that morning and said, don't worry, I'm going to win the world championship today. And he did. And it was such a great fairy story. I'll never forget it. He didn't quite sing it, We Are the Champions, as well as that, though, did he, on the radio? Remember that in lap? My bloody God. Uh, oh, Ross, with your new role now at the Liberty in Formula One, uh, we see weekends like it that bring the whole motorsport community together. All the OEMs are here. Old school, new school, different generations. You've got the age spread massively across the uh, interest, I suppose, the interest factor of such an event. So is there any learnings for us in Formula One going forward around these type of events that is working so well? No, no, absolutely. And I think what, um, what we want to do is continue to engage the keen fans, the traditional fans. We'll find uh, new ways of getting new fans into the sport. And these sort of events, perfect example. Uh, Chase, Ch Chase Carey, our chairman, was here yesterday. Uh, getting the full Goodwood experience. And uh, we want to harness some of this in a Formula One race in the future. The race is still the core of what goes on, but you want to have a great time with lots of other things, and Goodwood sets a fantastic example. Absolutely. Thank you, JB and Ross. I'm just going to now welcome on to the balcony, uh, well, who has to be thanked. 
for every single year without fail puts on this incredible event. And it doesn't matter if I'm talking to my Porsche guests from Germany, if I'm talking to Australians or Kiwis or your English guests, they just say, how the hell does such an organisation pull this off? And we're with the Duke of Richmond now. How do you do it? Well, I'm very lucky. I've got a great team here at Goodwood and we're blessed with this place and it's fabulous to see you all having such a great time. That gives me a lot of pleasure. So thank you all very much for coming. It's been fabulous sharing all this with you. And thanks so much to Jensen. He's probably been our most loyal uh, F1 driver. He's been coming for 17 years. Jensen, thanks so much. And, uh, and to Ross, too, for all he's doing for F1, all he's done for motorsport. It's just great to have all these people so closely involved. And everybody, the industry, all of you guys have been so enthusiastic and supportive from the beginning. Without that, it would never have happened. So thank you all very much. And thank you for 25 years. Thank you very much. Safe travels home. All the best. Thanks to Mark Webber, to Jensen Button, Ross Braun, and of course to our host, the Duke of Richmond. Great to hear from them all on the balcony of Goodwood House. And Goodwood always has these magic moments. And if that came as a bit of a surprise, I hope you've all enjoyed it because uh, Jensen's uh, involvement, Jensen's success, his contribution to motorsport uh, should never go uh, unnoticed. It was a quite stunning season. It was one of those out of the blue seasons, really. Underdog team came along, won the championship by rights. It shouldn't have even been on the grid, perhaps, because of all the travails through the winter. But it clicked, it gelled, and Jensen won that world championship that he knew he had in him. Other people from the junior single seater days knew he had in him. He came straight from Formula Ford into Formula 3 into Formula 1. Bang, 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 in three seasons. And then the career stagnated for a little while but when he was given the right machinery once again Martin Haven there was just no stopping him that year and as Mark Webber would say a proper bloke as well yeah. he's got no other side to him than what you see he loves his motor racing he inherited that from his father John who was a uh, an epic rally crosser and he had to really had to work hard for it they didn't have potloads of money and a number of times they sat down and had real hearts and hearts are we going to do this do you really want this badly enough and in the end he really, really did, and it took time, but the best things always do. Well, the sport in his blood, of course, his late father, John Button, a rally crosser. But we're back live with the action, so let's catch up with Keith Arler's great competitor, Keith. He's got a lovely collection of cars, and this is the very first Lola Mark 1. 60 years of Lola being celebrated this year, and sadly, to that we must add a memory of the recent owner, Martin Moraine, who died just a couple of months ago. Martin was a great enthusiast himself, and he used to, he used to race, of course, a back injury stopped him, but every year he would come to Le Mans as the best dressed guy in the place. Yeah, absolutely sharp as a button, and sharp as a pin as well, right until the last day. And we celebrating the history, we started our Porsche celebration, their 70th birthday, with the very first Porsche road car ever built. This is the very first Lola chassis ever built by Eric Broadley under that name. The Lola Mark 1 chassis 1 Kidalas conducting it with great aplomb. 1100cc climax power, light and nimble. A little bit later on in Lola's story as the car manufacturer came, the epic T70. Light it might still have been but it had a massive iron fist in its velvet glove. Exactly so. The T70 Spider, a John Surtees car, then to the later days, badged as a Nissan, but Lola built was the RC, uh, sorry, the R90 CK. Forgive me, Mark Blundell put it onto pole position. This was a uh, Blundell Gianfranco Brancatelli car. And what about a different sort of car altogether? This Chaparral with the high wing, the Jim Hall created car that was part of that Can-Am opposition to the Lola T70s. And you think of Can-Am cars as being fast. I was standing next to this this morning in the paddock. It's tiny. A modern Fiat Cinque Cinquecento sort of sized car, but it just looks enormous because it's so low compa compared to its width. A real groundbreaking car. The ex Dan Gurney All-American Racers team, 1969, Ford Boss Mustang 302. And this car that had uh, great success with its 5-litre V8 engine. Uh, here you have something completely different as well. Jeff Downs in the Eagle for the city of Daytona Beach Special. This going back to 1969. Tony Southgate, great race car designer, uh, designed Designed this for Dan Gurney's All American Racing Team, and again that name of Dan Gurney crops up again and again, doesn't it? In all sorts of cars, single seaters, GT cars, sports racing cars. As will Tony Southgate in a number yep. of designs here, not least of which will be the Jaguar XJ12D of Justin Law that'll be in the shootout later, aiming to claim 
fastest internal combustion engine on us on the hill because we may have a, a faster time set by electric vehicles this year for the very first time. So this car that uh, Joe Leonard took sixth with in the Indy 500 was running second until a hose failed. Uh, now, Johnny Rutherford with the 1980 Chaparral Cosworth 2K, three times an Indy 500 winner. Just to say the words, Johnny Rutherford in the Chaparral Cosworth. Absolutely. Special. And another legendary designer, designer John Barnard, cut his uh, Indy car teeth with cars like this for the Chaparral firm. This car from the Indianapolis Speedway Hall of Fame from their museum. And along with this car, the guys from Indy brought over the Ball Warner Trophy. The what? The huge silver trophy that is presented every year to the winner of the Indy 500. You see that down at the house as well. Now this is another great car. The Zach Speed built Ford Escort. It goes back to 1977. 300 horsepower, Cosworth BDG engine. Hans Heyer uh, was a champion with it. And uh, it is driven by Paolo Piazza Musso, the car from the German Group 5 series, the DRM, the Deutsche Rennsport Meisterschaft. And Hans Heyer, very, very rapid driver, went into the European Touring Car Championship for Jaguar, amongst other things. Michel Leclerc, one-time Grand Prix driver, at the wheel of this car, the one Le Mans in 1978, the Alpine Renault A442B for Didier Peroni and Jean-Pierre Josso. And Renault had had two previous attempts at it and failed and come back, learnt, failed, come back, learnt a bit more, and that year it clicked. And this was the racing car that kind of was a parallel development of Lance's 037 rally car after the Group 6 Barquette and the Group 5 Monte Carlo Turbo. And you can see those lines immediately then moved on into the Lancia LC1 and LC2, their Group C2, their Group C cars. But it was a, a fabulous looking device. Somewhere in there is the centre roof line of a Monte Carlo, nothing much else. And there is Jochen Maas in the Mercedes Benz 300 SLR. And Jochen is another huge enthusiast, and to be driving this gives him enormous pleasure. Uh, he, of course, was a Mercedes driver. He was a Grand Prix racer, never got a Grand Prix win, uh, but not for the want of trying. Again, it was kind of wrong place, wrong time for him. But uh, Jochen, who is a house captain at members' meeting, barely misses a Goodwood, and uh, love him driving this 300 SLR. Hugely competitive sports car racer after his Formula One career, particularly with Mercedes. And he exercises an awful lot of old Mercedes machinery. 658, the sister car of 722, with which Sterling Moss and Denning Jen Dennis Jenkinson won the 55. Milia. A mark of the man is that he's driving cars from Porsche's museum and from Mercedes' yes. museum. Yeah. You know, he's not become typecast. He's not persona non grata with one because he's working for the other. Valtteri Bottas, having had a go in pretty much the latest technology, <laughs> goes right back in time. How about this? So he's now going up the hill going centre throttle, right hand brake, centre <laughs> throttle, right hand brake, obviously in Suomi. Yeah, Valtteri Bottas with his own Formula One car. And now, as you say, going back to the 1950s and not hanging about either. I don't think he's allowed to do donuts in this one, but it's a 1954 car, yeah. nine Grand Prix wins, thanks to Fangio and Moss. Space frame chassis, it could be run with different wheelbases and different bodywork. And Valtteri Bottas entering into the spirit of the Goodwood Festival of Speed, coming up towards Malcolm Corner. Well, listen, he may never have driven it in his life, but he's right beside those side decks of exhaust, and every time he hits the noise, suddenly he gets this fabulous bellow. That has got to be so intoxicating. It makes up the rest of this season, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. This was certainly a noisier car, and there he is, sitting on top of the noise, never mind around it. Yes, absolutely. We've split drive shafts going yeah. on the side of the driver. Then you've got Jack Hawksworth with the Lexus RCF car. You've got Rhys Millen, who we are told is driving the Bentley Continental GT3. We were expecting Guy Smith to be the wheel of that, but it's conceivable that Rhys Millen will be having a go. Well, he is having a go as he comes past us at Molecombe now. You'll pick him up in a moment after we've had a look at the Lexus RCF Cup. Latest V8 Lexus. Up towards the top of the hill through the shade, there are the big uh, lights on the back of the Bentley Continental GT. As you say, the latest iteration was driven by Guy Smith earlier in the weekend, who's now become uh, a former Bentley racer and a Bentley ambassador. But Reese Millen, a man who knows how to get performance out of cars up a hill. This car new this year. This is the latest 488 Ferrari, the GTE for the World Endurance Championship, with world champion in his class, James Collado, driving it. Uh, behind that, you will find the BMW M8, the very latest GT campaigner from BMW. Collado's enjoyed being an utter hooligan at the start line. We haven't seen it this time, but he's left it with pools of smoke behind. I don't know how many tyres he's got through in that car. Alexander Sims, another 
uh, current BMW GT driver in the World Endurance Championship, and I expect he'll be in their machinery in the Spa 24 hours in a couple of weeks as well. Well, he's a Spa 24 winner, isn't he? Yeah, he's got he a great is. CV out there. Ambassador for the British Racing Drivers Club, Superstar Ski, Ray Grimes, in what almost looks like a baby Ferrari. Uh, this without the aero of the 488 GTE is the car that runs in all the pan-European, pan-global uh, one-make championships that Ferrari operates. Then you've got Ben Schneider, reunited with the Mercedes-Benz CLK LM. There it is, Ben yeah. FIA GT champion in this car. Now, he drove car number one with Mark Webber. Car number two here, Klaus Ludwig and Ricardo Zonta, the teammates that won the FIA GT championship in 1989. And Ben Schneider told Bruce Jones a couple of days ago he wasn't disappointed about not winning Le Mans because Porsche went one two. He was disappointed about that about not being a world champion because his teammates in the other garage claimed that title. 99 car. 99 car. Bus on its way. Uh, Aston Martin here for Nicky Team, who has moved away from great success in Porsche as former Porsche Super Cup champion, but in Aston Martin, he has been a real star over the last few seasons, whether it's been on the world stage or the British GT Championship. Yeah, the Dane Chain drivers, he and Marco Sorensen, along with Darren Turner and the rest of the factory drivers, also racing in British GT this season at every race. So you'll be able to see them all across the UK and at Silverstone in the WEC race. Now, we've seen Jetpack Man. This is another version of Jetpack, isn't it? But this is Jetpack Car. This is the Lotus Pratt & Whitney 56, the STP Special. Uh, it's got a turbine engine, it's four-wheel drive, it has huge pace, and effectively this Lotus 56 should have been a winner at the 1968 Indianapolis 500, but uh, there were three cars and bad luck hit all of them. Joe Leonard was the best placed up to the end. He was leading, and then with seven laps to go, the car dropped out. It was, in terms of results, not a success. In terms of what it achieved from an engineering point of view, a great success. Uh, and again, so many Lotuses we've seen up the hill this weekend, each one illustrating the mind, the genius of Colin Chapman. He must have been a nightmare to work with. How you yeah. ever got one solid idea out of Colin Chapman, I can't imagine. You must have flitted between flights of fancy so many times. And this is one of the cars that helps cement the colours of SDP, Andy Granatelli, uh, promoting those oil treatment products that you also see on Richard Petty's cars over the years. And that Lotus, it was, you know, one of those three pence washer pieces that uh, cost him victory. And there is the Lotus Ford 29 of Mitch Cobb, another car from the Americana class. It's a Jim Clark car, this, that uh, shot the establishment at Indianapolis. And then. Hold on to your hats, everybody. Not just because of the cars, but because of the sound that goes with them. Jared Downer is back in the house. We have Chris the Force Forsberg coming out of the gate, and he wants to go wall to wall. Well, in this instance, it's not wall to wall. Bale to bale. Talking about the hay bales and where the asphalt meets the grass. We'll dry a little bit here, but they're going to dry up a little more. They're going to throw some flames at it. Chris the Force Forsberg, three time Formula Drift champion. He has a V8, a VK Nissan engine, or Nissan, pardon my, uh, pardon my American there, the Nissan 370Z. You'll do, we're impressed. That'll do. You're an honorary pole now, you're an honorary Brit, well done. Yeah, and, and Toby always used to make fun of me with the pickles, and, what, what's the kind of chip, pickles and onions or something like that? Pickle. What is it? A plowman's. So uh, right now, this guy's plowing some lawn here. Chris LaForce Forsberg, <laughs> originally from Pennsylvania, now living in Southern California. You can see his carbon fiber hood flapping in the wind. That's because, again, he needed to make room underneath his hood. Chris Forsberg currently competes in the Formula Drift Championship. He competes in a VQ 370Z, similar to this. It's twin turbo, has anti lag it's loud and proud. Now this vehicle, this is another Formula Drift Champion. Vaughn Gittin Jr., Captain Clutch Kick, RTR. It's his brand, it's a lifestyle, ready to rock. Crab kicks, football, and now drifting. That's what Maryland does. This little tire, four performance, monster energy, Mustang RTR. Look at that, airing it out. Looks like he's going to put on, doing some more landscaping there. He does have a big yard. He does have a, a riding lawnmower in the state. So it, 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 it's, it's, it's only customary that he does this. Talking about shrapnel underneath his vehicle, he comes directly from the Nordschleife, the green monster. He came from Nürburgring with this vehicle. This is the RTR Spec 5D. The D stands for drift. The Spec 5, wide body, Ford Mustang. He's been a longtime partner with Ford Mustang. He's been competing once since 2005. This house is a Roush Yates engine under the hood. 
These guys want to put on a show. They want to let you know that, you know, these guys are talented drivers. They're, they're just using minute measures of, of just talent to utilize the whole track. Are you impressed? So far, so good. And I'm a bit <laughs> snooty about things like this, but I tell you, after three or four days, you've won me over. I appreciate it. I'm sure they do. Again, actions speak louder than words, and that's come from announcers. So that's a lot being said. Bagsy, Steve Bagsy Bagioni, Monster Energy. What's all this in the back? Come on. Oh, looks like he grew a tail. He oh, grew a tail man. here. He uh, looks like he got a little too aggressive in the dirt in his mind. He's the only Brit here in our field of drivers. This has a LS, so it has an LS under the hood with turbos the size of, I, I told you, Toby's head, but he has a tiny head. I have a massive head. <laughs> They're as big as my head. So, uh, yeah, this is nearly, a, I think it's 1,100 horsepower this vehicle houses. You notice how Jared only points out that he's a Brit when the car is damaged. No, Thanks I did not. You pointed that out. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I love Bagsy. He'll be competing at uh, Gymkhana Grid. There's a date to be announced. He competes within many different events here in the UK. IDC, BDC. Make some noise for him if you like what you see. Vessel, Speed, Goodwood. These are professional drifters. Some of the best in the world. Dean Carnage Carney. This has 1,000 horsepower. This is supercharged SRT 10. 10 cylinders. Big supercharger. And... Let's throw some nitrous at it. Dean Carnage Carney, Oracle Lighting, that is a lighting company. They're here in the building. They're cheering them on. Achilles tires underneath the vehicle. Toby had the question earlier uh, in this weekend asking about tires. These are the same tires that you can run in your very own car. They are DOT certified Department of Transportation. Wow. They're not treated. They're not smooth. They're not slick. And that is rules and regulations. They can't, uh, they can't have, you know, even wheel fasteners. Like in, you know, off-road racing, you can't have basically bead locks. You wow. can't have anything like wow. that. So for more, for more on professional drifting, the main drifting section by I myself have competed in there and now have competed announcing in the Formula Gym Championship for 15 years. It's called FormulaD.com. It's stateside as well as in Japan and we traveled all over. Mad Mike. Mad Mike with dead the bell of the ball or the kiwi of the ball. He's not Mad Mike. I think he's mellow. He's just he's a, he's a soft hearted man. He's got his wife at home, Tony, Lincoln and Jet. They're watching just outside of Auckland. This is the RX 7.3. This is Dean Madbull. It has the RX 3 front end, which is curated by him, and Rocket Bunny, which is the company. Rotoforms is surrounded by some Neto tires. This is a four rotor, so that's why it sounds like the homage to the old Mazda Lamal race car. This peripheral porting, like I said, just over 500 horsepower. Make some noise right in front of the Goodwood house. This is the last time you will be seeing the drifters. Looks like he throws open the door, chucks a deuce. What do you guys say? Come on, let's give him a big hand. Send it, Goodwood. I had not said that saying this weekend, but I know there's a lot of Drift fans out there waiting for me to say it, but there's no better way to send it out here with some of these awesome drifters. James Dean, unfortunately, he popped his engine. He was putting on a show for you guys in his SR-powered FDRX7. Speaking of Mad Mike, speaking of James Dean, Dean Carney, we will be in Liverpool. I say we because we will have Red Bull Drift Shifters on the waterfront in Liverpool there where pinball meets drifting. So come check us out in Liverpool, Beatles, and now drifting is what's gonna reside in Liverpool. Mad Mike, Dean Carney, James Dean, of course, here this weekend, Chris Forsberg, and that of Vaughn Ginn Jr. and Bagsy Bagsioni. Jared, thank you very, very much indeed. I feel like I've just been thrown into a tumble drive. Uh, brilliant, well done, thank you so much. Let's hear from some of the stars of that last batch at the top of the hill with Bruce Jones. Just waiting for the last of the drifters to come up the top of the hill. I'm just chasing after Valtteri Bottas, who uh, has moved back in time to the 1950s. What was it like driving the W196 Mercedes? Uh, amazing, you know, amazing experience. I never, never done it before, so I was sorry, really looking forward to that. Uh, so yeah, it was good. And they told you what to expect, or they just said drive up the hill? Uh, they said basically just put me in the car and said good luck. So <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an amazing piece of history. What do you think of the drifters? Here comes Mad Mike. These guys are nuts. <laughs> I think that's an understatement. Valtteri, thank you so much. I'm going to keep on walking up the hill because eventually silence will fall, but Mad Bike ain't finished yet in the Mad Bull. He's going back for more. And more, and more. I thought this engine was loud at the Mans, but... Uh, the quad rotor flame spitter. And now finally, the only noise at the top of the hill is the applause. Bagsy, 
you're a fellow drifter and even you put your hands up to that one yeah mike does an awesome job he's such a showman uh he's an amb a great ambassador for the sport and he always puts on a great show for everybody here at goodwood and uh it's a privilege and an honor to be able to come here and drive with such amazing drivers including mike and uh yeah it's awesome just to come here be a part of this show and uh show everybody what drifting's all about well you guys have done an astonishing job and you all deserve to have your trumpets blown because it has been truly magnificent i'm going to wait till the the flames have stopped spitting out go and grab my bad mike but well done for your great great performances here this weekend Thank you. so for one last time i'm gonna go stick my head into the the greatest showman come on mad mike wow. finally you can relax i know you won't Oh man, it's just been an epic weekend. It's a bummer, it's Sunday and that was the last run up the hill, but we got the top 10 shootout, which we're really looking forward to sitting down and watching. But um, yeah, massive thanks to the Duke of Richmond putting on such a massive event. All the, all the uh, spectators for coming out, it's just, this is the event of the year. So uh, thank you everyone for your support. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming out. Thanks very much, Mike Mike, we cannot top that. So that's that for now from the top of the hill. Back shortly for the shootout. Great to hear from the drifters up at the top of the hill and uh, excellent stuff. Well, there's plenty more to come yet because we've got two more batches of cars taking us from supercars to the very early days, the dawn of motoring virtually. But before all of that, it is going to be the shootout and that is coming up in around quarter of an hour's time. We will look forward to seeing what promises to be a breathtaking spectacle. So that will be coming up very shortly here at the 2018 Goodwood Festival of Speed presented by MasterCard. Welcome everybody to the Goodwood Festival of Speed in association with MasterCard and today is the day. We have the shootout, who is going to be our champion of this year and it might well be this man here, Roman Dumas. You've got the fastest time ever for an electric car up the hill yesterday. Can you break the overall record this afternoon? All right, that's a, that's a good question, you know. First of all, our target is to be the fastest electric car ever here on the hill so yeah we were fast yesterday already but it's my first time here it's the first time for the car the car as uh, you can see is quite large the road here is very narrow we are getting faster and faster so we will see this morning will be very important we try now to set up a little bit more the car to push the car on the limit and now I think I will see now in, in 20 minutes which time I can do this afternoon. Now, Roman, have you left anything on the table? Do you feel there's a little bit more lap time to come out of you, the driver? Yeah, yeah, I think I can, I hope I can get in a little bit. It was only my third time, my third try. So for sure, driver-wise, I can get in a little bit, but not so much. But you know, it's getting smaller and smaller. So each 10 of seconds will count now. So we try now different again set up and to tune the battery a little bit. So we will see at the end of the day again, the target is only to try to be the fastest electric car. Now for you folks at home, there are more than 600 cars here at the Festival of Speed. A hugely eclectic mix, but this one, what we call the Volkswagen Pikes Peak electric car, is perhaps the most beastish of them all. Can you just throw some stats at us, Roman, like how much horsepower this produces and why it's nothing like anything you and I drive on the road? Well, this car actually is a little bit more than one ton, but it's 680 horsepower, but with the electric power, as soon as you touch the throttle, you have all the power, you know? It's not like a normal engine, turbo, aspirated engine. As soon as you go on gas, you, are, you have the full power. So it's where we are gaining a lot of time. On top of that, we are four-wheel drive, one e-motor on the front, one e-motor on the rear, completely separate, so we can play also with the balance with this e-motor. Okay, so it's very different, even to the cars that you won the Le Mans 24 hours in. Yeah, completely. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's also a lot of downforce because in Pikes Peak we have no, no rule, so we can do what we want. So this car is for sure as the same number or even more than a Formula One car in terms of downforce. For sure, the only disadvantage is the car is quite heavy, more than one ton. It's a lot more than any single seat car. 
But that's the end of package, it's not too bad. Okay, it's gonna be sensational this shootout. Watch out for this man. So we are getting ready for the shootout here at the 2018 Goodwood Festival of Speed. Uh, the cars will be making their way down towards the start line very shortly. We have currently got uh, the uh, cars making their way back down the hill from that previous run. We have got so many stunning cars here. It is just not true. Now, we need to remind ourselves before we get to the shootout itself what the Goodwood Hill Climb course is all about. It is only just over a mile in its length, but it has an awful lot of technical sections to it. So, you blast away from the start, you're up through the gears, you turn right, you're climbing all the time, you're onto park straight, it's not billiard table smooth, and then you get to Molecombe Corner, which is very deceptive indeed. Lots of people have got it wrong. Then you're into the Flint Wall, the little S that takes you right and left. There's another Another right at Carnet seat, you go left, just up towards the finish line. 1.16 miles. The fastest ever driver up here is Nick Heidfeld. He did it in 41.6 seconds in a McLaren MP4 13 back in 1999. He averaged 100.385 miles an hour, and it looked like this. This was the car that was the reigning Formula One World Championship car because the Finn Mika Hakkinen had just won the World Championship in it in 1998. But McLaren came here to Goodwood with new different gear ratios. They raised the right height of the car, but they had the tyre warmers. They had a three-litre Mercedes V10 engine mounted in the back of the McLaren. And Heidfeld, the youngster, he was hungry, he was quick on the world circuits, and he was certainly not afraid as he rushed up towards the Flint Wall with some, what, 850 horsepower, and as he came through towards the top of the hill through the quick left-hander, he came over the finish line at over 141 miles an hour, and he took the outright hill record at 41.6 seconds. And here we are, David, 19 years later, and it has yet to be beaten. And it is going to be a fabulous uh, opportunity to see some stunning cars just while we get ready for that. Bear in mind that the rally stage is uh, busy as well today. And up there enjoying all the action are Xavier McCartan and Tony Jardine. And on the stage at the moment is uh, Ross Mason. We're in the middle of the shootout. And already we've had some terrific times set. Ollie Mellows on a 231.8. And uh, that's Nabilia Tejpar. Uh, currently on the start line in her Peugeot 2082 and she's dovetailing a British Rally Championship campaign with the Peugeot Iberia series where she will compete or has competed in Portugal and will compete in Rally Spain and uh, she is about to take to the stage in her Peugeot 208 and uh, Nabilia's father Aziz has been here over the weekend as well campaigning the Allied Polymer Ford Escort Mark II but the action and competition is intense here at the moment. Russ Mason now coming up uh, towards the end of the stage and carrying the Richard Burns Foundation. The logo's in the back of the car where he's been raising money for them over the course of the weekend as Nabilia Tejpar leaves the start line. And of course the shootout in two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive form is really, really important and adds that edge of competition uh, to the competition we naturally have here uh, at the Goodwood Festival of Speed rally stage where we're celebrating 50 years of the Ford Escort uh, with various Mark 1s, ex-work cars, various Mark 2s. A wonderful shot there, as you can see, of David Wright and the ex-Carla Sainz World Rally Car. Uh, David currently uh, running for as quick a time as is possible and some great camera work by the team here to give you an indication of how committed and how hard the drivers are trying here. You watch the angles and the lines that they take. Of course, the car synonymous with Colin McRae. And, uh, of course, as he just catches that inside right-hander. And we have a huge display of Colin McRae and Richard Burns' cars here. Martin Spurl telling me earlier it's the biggest we've ever seen and unlikely to be repeated. Can we just catch a, a replay? We've changed the hairpin down at that corner of Delta this year. Uh, just to make it into a more natural hairpin and as we just watch slides ever so wide and carries the speed through and just touches the bank and sometimes the banks can be a help and keep you on the stage and sometimes they will catch you out and uh, take you off it now David Wright over the finish line It'll be interesting to see what time that he does make because it's pride and 
the desire for competition uh, in the shootout here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed rally stage. Nabilia Tejpar uh, guiding very nicely around that hairpin for Peugeot 208 R2. And as you can see, the grip difference between the two-wheel drive cars and the four-wheel drive, as well as the difference between front-wheel drive and rear-wheel drive. But Nabilia uh, shining brightly in the British Rally Championship last year and has done rather well this year in the opening round of the British Championship, as well as the round in Portugal, where she won her class and uh, collected uh, several other awards. And in the background, the... Uh, Andrew's Heat for Hire Ford Escort, synonymous with the longest running sponsorship and rallying, the Andrew's Heat for Hire concern. Uh, based in Wolverhampton, John Andrews himself, a fervent supporter of rallying and a variety of cars that carried uh, the company's sponsorship down the years with the former British rally champion Russell Brooks. You can just hear in the background the time's been discussed some of the marshals and that's a great shot of the car scrabbling and struggling for grip as Nabilia brings the 208 R2 up over the finish line. There's a great shot of David Brown in the Andrews Heat for Hire car and behind him was the Triumph TR7 V8 that we have seen run several times on the stage of open memories of Tony Pond, Simo Lampin and Per Eklund. And Roger Duckworth uh, runs a little bit wide down on the entry into Delta. Joining us this afternoon for a little bit of time has been Robin Bradford and Robin action really, really good we've seen so far. It has been brilliant, Zav. What I found interesting about this is that you're looking at an absolutely brand new state-of-the-art Proton as created by Mr. Miller's Motorsport, who's just wandered out of our box. And a lot of the competition comes from cars that are significantly older. And it's interesting to see how important people find this stage. I'm just going to look at Chris Mellis and say, does the rally stage... Uh, we're just uh, catching the replay again then. Of Roger Duckworth. And you caught the replay then. Who had some issues with his uh, motor yesterday. And uh, next up, uh, we've got the times uh, showing up now. Oliver Mellor's quickest on 2.31.8. David Wright in the Focus 2.34.5. And Mark Courtney in his uh, Impreza is 2.38.1. And uh, the next time that, the next time that uh, Ollie goes out in the Proton, uh, he's going to have Alistair McRae sat alongside him to uh, reunite Alistair with the uh, Proton. Some of the times you see there, uh, really impressive. Ollie Mellors, as I said, uh, was certainly going to want to take the fastest time in the shootout. As David Brown brings the uh, Russell Brooks, Andrew's Heat for Hire Escort at the stage, and this is a car that has sat in a garage for 10 years uh, and very, very little done with it, and uh, David decided to bring it out and uh, freshen it, rebuild, rebuild the engine, rebuild the gearbox and the axle, um, freshen up the paint, and it is more or less as it was uh, whenever he came into ownership 10 years ago. Uh, we're spoiled uh, here at the rally stage with period cars, such as uh, the Andrews Heat for Hire Escort, as well as uh, the Triumph TR7 V8 here that we see, evoking memories of the British Airways sponsorship. And... Uh, it will be taken to the stage very, very soon. But I look back at what we've had today. Maxil Castillon in the Saab 99, showing you that the coverage of cars here begins very, very early on in rally cars. The Mini, synonymous with Paddy Hopkirk and Monte Carlo and the controversy that uh, Paddy and the team faced. And of course, the Lancia uh, 1.3. Uh, it runs through, for example, with the TR7 V8 and uh, a lot of Mark I Escorts, Mark II Escorts that are here celebrating 50 years of the Ford Escort, including uh, on the service area uh, up here in the paddock, uh, the wonderful and much sought after RS 1700T.
so our thanks to Xavier McCartan and Robin Bradford up on the rally stage. Good to hear from them and also good to see the cars. Don't forget the rally stage. It has been busy all weekend. We're not done up there yet, uh, but I would urge you not to tear yourselves away just yet from the hill because that is going to be live very shortly for our shootout. The cars will make their way down to the far end of the hill. They'll be there on the start line and then we should be good to go. It's going to take a few minutes to grid up, but this gives us a chance to have a look at the great eclectic mix of cars. The order should be the reverse of the times set yesterday. I can't promise you that because these things are easier to organise than others, but that would be the plan as uh, we see there Peter Dumbreck in the Neo EP9 electric technology rules right now because the EP9 was second fastest in the qualifying round yesterday behind the Volkswagen of Roman Dumas. And there is the back of the Volkswagen of Roman Dumas. And uh, isn't it incredible, David, that here we are in 2018 and the two fastest qualifying cars for our shootout are both pure electric powered. The Roman Dumas Volkswagen IDR that only two, three weekends ago went to Pikes Peak and utterly smashed the outright record that was set only five years ago by Sebastian Loeb in the Peugeot, which was really a spin-off by the LMP1, the Le Mans mechanics, who had nothing to do after that project was canned. And here we are five years later in an 875 horsepower car that weighed only 875 kilograms was beaten by the, uh, the, the guys in Wolfsburg. It's incredible it's insane, it? the way that technology has bounded along so quickly in, those, in that gap of five years. Likewise, the uh, Peter Dumbreck, the Neo, six minutes and 47 seconds around the Nordschleife. He did that a year last June. <laughs> uh, one of the problems that Dumbreck was saying was it's just getting it off the line. The speed is immense for Dumbreck, but it's just getting it off the line, and that's the key to hill climbing. Absolutely, and don't forget that although we are treating this quite rightly as a hill climb, these aren't guys that are hill climb regulars. Some might do in the SEC events, but the majority are circuit racers, and they do a lap out of the pit lane. They do a warming up lap, and then they go racing. And we heard from Frank Beeler, one of the drivers here in DTM technology over the course of this weekend, saying that normally in this car, it would take you four laps to get the tyres up to temperature. Four laps, you haven't got four miles. You've got 1.16 miles, and if your tyres on up to temperature, you're going to struggle. That's the thing about modern hill climbing in the European and the British Championship is that there are special tyres manufactured that don't need any tyre warmers. They are very soft, they're very pliable and they, they warm up literally in the sunshine and the trick to get some heat into your rears is spinning the rears, spinning the rears, spinning the rears before you come to the start line and then you sit on the start line and you strap yourself in ultra tight literally that you can't breathe and then go and you've got to be on it absolutely perfect every gear change the first corner the second corner whether or not you are at Prescott at Gersten down at Dune at Harewood or Shelsley Walsh it's a tremendous adrenaline experience to be a hill climb racer here at the 2018 Goodwood Festival of Speed, we are looking at this great celebration of 70 years of Porsche, the Jerry Judah sculpture in front of Goodwood House. We are ready for the shootout, and the plan is that you take the times that they set in the qualifying run yesterday and you reverse the order. Now, that takes the officials down at the start line a fair amount of work to get everybody in that order, but that's the plan, and very shortly we'll be able to get the first cars up towards the line. Looking down, uh, in theory, it should be the Alfa Romeo 1750 GT AM of Gerard that will go first, but uh, we'll wait and see whether that is indeed still going to be the plan. We've got such great variety of cars here, ranging from uh, pre-war Grand Prix machinery right up to the very latest technology, winning Pikes Peak, the Volkswagen, but you've got Indy cars, you've got touring cars, you've got European hill climb cars, you've got rallycross cars, you've got British touring cars, past and present, you've got NASCAR, you've got Formula 5000, there's pretty much everything. Totally everything. Uh, we've also got, you know, old Formula One cars in the shape of a Benetton from 1992. The chassis similar to the one that Michael Schumacher won his very first Formula One Grand Prix in back in that year, 92. There is a sort of a mini shootout within the big shootout as well, David, because we've got the British touring car guys from this year, Ingram, Neil, Cook, Morgan and Jordan battling for their own 
sort of class win. That's right, absolutely. The British Touring Car Championship is 60 years old this year, and uh, we've got six of the star drivers that are going to go for this shootout amongst them. And Andrew Jordan has been, perhaps as you might expect, given that he is Goodwood's track tester, the man to beat. Well, can he be beaten? We shall find out. It is Rob Austin with the Alfa Romeo Giulietta, Matt Neal with the Honda Civic, Andrew Jordan's BMW versus Adam Morgan in the Sicily Motorsport Run A-Class, uh, Josh Cook in the Vauxhall Astra, Tom Ingram in the Toyota Avensis. So there's that uh, independent competition that's going to be going on within this uh, run. Terry Grant in the Range Rover is also somebody that you need to keep an eye on because he is after a Guinness World Record. He wants to do all the way up the hill in under two minutes and 55 seconds. He tried earlier on and he got oh so close to doing it. He got as far as Flint Wall and just skimmed the wall, then in turn bounced him across to the other side and he ended up against the bales on two wheels. So that was probably, what, three quarters of the way up the hill. He was dipped back onto his wheels and he got to the end and did donuts instead. But here we go, a Guinness World Record attempt. Terry Grant on two wheels. The clock has started. Can he get to the top on two wheels? And if so, can he do it in less than two minutes and 55 seconds? Just think about this. Think about the weight of this car. Think about how difficult it is to maintain concentration on a bumpy road with a crown in the middle. You can see the concentration on Terry Grant's face. You've got to maintain the balance. This isn't in a straight line. This is climbing all the time. You've got right-handers, you've got left-handers, and this is far from easy. I managed to look at the car after it had that moment, as you described earlier, David, that it was up against the bales because it hit the bales. Not a dent, of course, in the car at all. But I literally went around to kick the tyres yesterday and it hurt my toe <laughs> because they are as tight as any balloon you could ever imagine. They are absolutely rock hard. The whole sidewall structure is immensely stiff. And look at the speed was for two say. wheels that he's doing underneath the bridge through the heat haze. We won't give you an intermediate split. We won't give you an intermediate speed trap as he comes up towards Malcolm. But the concentration that you could see in his face. Also, the sun in his eyes very is true. also something very difficult for him. Come on, let's cheer him up. Well, then, lots of applause from those of you at the approach to Malcolm Corner. Grandstands are busy. Let's cheer him on. Give him some noise as he comes through the corner out of that left-hander and now up the straight. The road getting steeper and steeper at this point. He's got not quite as far as he did earlier on because it was just after this section at Flint Wall that it just kind of unraveled a bit for him. He's got the sun in his eyes, but he's also now going from dark to light because you're going under the trees where it's shade and then it's like somebody flicks the lights back on. As you come out the other side. Now, this is the tricky bit. I mean, like it's not been tricky already, <laughs> but I mean, this is where it went wrong for him this morning. So, let's hold our breath for him. Let's wish him well because he goes through the right. Now, the left. This is where he got the wheels on the wall earlier on. The first task, never mind the time, he's just getting to the finish. He has gone further than he went this morning. Terry Grant is almost there. Here he comes towards the quick right-hander. This To hold it now he's just continuing to climb using the power using the v8 power as he comes up towards the left i was going to say quick left-hander difficult left-hander as you say if it's not hard enough one oh. more corner to go the finish line is in sight he's nearly done it nobody has been up the hill this week on the weekend on two wheels is he going to be able to do it let's see he's nearly there he's nearly there he's nearly there the checkered flag is at the ready for a two-wheeling terry Gray how about that? We'll get a time as soon as we can, but the main thing is that he has done it all the way up the Goodwood Hill on two wheels. Sensational. We are ready for the shootout here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. David Addison and Toby Moody ready for what is going to be a breathtaking hour of action. We've got cars dating back to the start of the 1900s right up to modern day technology. We've got drivers from all walks of life and we've just been treated to Terry Grant here going up the hill on two wheels. And now to celebrate, the donuts come. We need to find out whether that was under two minutes and 55 seconds. If it was, it's a new record. We'll put him into the Guinness world record list.
and a 2 minute 25.42. 2 minutes 25.42. That means, everybody, you've just witnessed a new Guinness World Record by Terry Grant. So, Terry Grant it is, who starts off the activity with a world record. Are we going to get a new Goodwood Hill record? Not from George Wingard, we're not, but what we are going to witness here is some breathtaking technology. The Goodwood Festival of Speed has always showcased remarkable cars, and here is one such. Away will go the Cotin de Groot GP Hill Climber. It is George Wingard with Mrs. Wingard as the riding mechanic. It's a car that goes back to 1911. It was the winner of the 1911 uh, Mont Ventoux Hill Climb in France. It was a course that went up to 53,000 feet in 13.4 miles on an unpaved surface. If you can do that, you can do Goodwood. 5,300 feet uh, as he got to the top of Mont Ventoux, but it was very much part of the European hill climbing scene, Mont Ventoux. It was also part of the Tour Auto, the Tour de France race that happened in the 60s and the 70s. Those of you who follow cycling know how barren it is up there, how steep it is up there, how difficult it is to get up there. And in this era, David, you know, 1911, it was still it was still the it was still the way of manufacturers uh, showing their pace that they could actually climb the hill. So the car goes through the flint wall, the time ticking away. We've already gone through the intermediate split, which gives us a measure of how things are going for the competitors. And now he gets up towards the top of the 1.16 miles. And bear in mind that these sector times will become more important when we get to the uh, later runners. For now, it's just a chance to wallow in the machinery, isn't it? Because this will start us off with a target time. So through will go George Winger. That is 92.32 seconds. He goes the fastest, but it won't stay that way because we go straight to Alfa Romeo. This is Annette Wiesman with the HC2300 Monza. It makes a glorious noise, and Annette Wiesman has been getting quicker and quicker all across the weekend. Uh, another car from our pre-war Grand Prix car category, and this should go quicker than the 92 seconds, heading now up towards the timing line. So Annette Wiesman will break the beam, and the time is going to go top. It's an 86.63. 5.69 seconds quicker for a car similar to which that won at Monza in the 30s. Now, can you imagine this? The Mercedes 60 horsepower. Now, this is Gareth Graham making his way up to the hill. I don't think there's many gear changes involved here because it's all about torque and maintaining momentum. And imagine being that riding mechanic in period on bumpy roads with no safety, no roll cage, no seat belts, no nothing. It goes fastest, though, 79.26 seconds and brave driving by Gareth Graham. Here is Sally Mason Steeran. She was the first car to climb the Goodwood Festival of Speed hill climb back in 1993. She saw this car in the early 70s. She fell in love with it. She always kept tabs on where it was in the world. And then, then it came up for sale and she said, I've just got to have it. She drives it all over the world. It finished fourth in the Mille Amelia in 1950. Sally gets to the top of the hill and she does a 78.5 second run. She goes top as a consequence, but that time is going to be beaten for sure. Now, what about this car? Philip Dressel at the wheel of the Mercedes. This is uh, another car from pre-war power, the 710 SSK. 7.1 litre straight six supercharged, designed by Ferdinand Porsche won numerous races in the hands of Rudolf Kratchiel and others, and as it comes across the timing line, that is enough to go quickest on a 75.57, a full three seconds quicker than the rest. In 1908, the new Grand Prix rules meant that Mercedes came up with this. Now, this is Ben Collings. He knows how to guide these cars up hill climbs, around circuits, or even to take his children to school on the Herefordshire Welsh borders, because he uses this car to do just that. Again, another car with torque and power, low revving of course, they have the riding mechanic alongside them, pumping the fuel pressure up to make sure that the car can get to the end of the race, to the top of the hill climb. It's going to be close by the time they get to the top, 75.57 seconds is the time to beat for Ben Collings here at Goodwood, and he just misses out by just over a tenth of a second. And then the next car, here is Duncan Pitaway making his way up the hill in the 
Cheetah. Now, this had all sorts of engine problems earlier on in the weekend. It now sounds like it's got gearbox problems, sadly. But there's one in there somewhere. Duncan has been stirring away. He's found something that will motivate him up the hill. Well, he's brought the car. He's determined he's going to use it. And it just adds this extraordinary variety to this year's event. Yes, he took the engine out of his camper to, uh, to get it going again as you do when you have a camper with a great big thumping V8 pushrod engine. Brilliant, that's yeah. pitch away through and through. It's a 1963 car, but then we go back in time to this because the Mercedes now climbs the hill. This is the car with Martin Wiesman at the wheel, and uh, it is a car, the Mercedes W125, that had great success uh, with Caracciola at the wheel, amongst others, the rear engine car heading towards the timing line. Now he's got a beat, a 75.57, and can he do it? He should be on here, because he's nearly at the end of the run. You can see now, as the cars get faster, how little time it takes to gobble up the real estate, and that is a 68.64, very nearly seven seconds quicker than the rest to go fastest of all. But James Wood in the Alfa Romeo P3, the Tipo B here, is no slouch either. Uh, this is a very low seating position in this car for these guys. The prop shaft splits. There's two differentials either side of the driver's seat. And uh, this is evocative of pre-war Monza Grand Prix racing. 68.6. He's going to go top of the pile. And he goes to first position. The Alfa Romeo, James Wood with the P3, is fastest on a 66.17. And now we go touring cars because this is Tim Morley with the Group 2 spec Triumph Dolomite Sprint. And the sort of car that Andy Rouse, Derek Bell, David Hobbs shared in the Tourist Trophy, the European Touring Car Championship race that year. So now the Dolomite Sprint of the 70s has got to beat a Grand Prix car, the Extensio Nivellari Alfa of the 30s. Can he do anything better than a 66? He should do. He does do. 63.09 for the Dolomite Sprint in the hands of Tim Morley. Next up, we've got Frank Lyons in the gurney, the Eagle Chevrolet. He did a 65-second run in practice and qualifying. He's going to have to find a couple of seconds to go top of the pile to do a 63. He looks like he's going to do it. Oh, a brilliant run. So 60.62. First position for the gurney, Eagle Chevy. Now, what about this? The Mini is next in the hands of uh, Charles Rainford. There were hordes of these in the British Saloon Car Championship. Normally shrouded in tire smoke, driven on three wheels. John Rhodes is one of the real heroes, but Charles Rainsford is no slouch. Didn't expect him to beat a Formula 5000 car, but let's see where he slots in, for example, against the Dolomite Sprint. 60.62 to beat. He's going to be a 62, is it? Let's see. 62.31 is the time. He goes into second position. A valiant effort from a tiny little car. We're celebrating an anniversary of the Ford Escort here this weekend, and this is the Frank Gardner 1968 British Touring Car Championship winning Escort Mark 1 twin cam. Henry Mann is at the wheel of it. Uh, his father, Alan Mann, legendary Ford team owner and uh, very successful too, and Henry Mann is a very rapid driver in his own right. He has got to try and beat a time now 60.62 seconds. He's not quite going to do that, but again, where will he slot in against the Dolomite and the Mini? He will go third on a 62.37. So we go another four cylinders up. It's the Rover, the SD1, the Hepolite color scheme, the Rover V8. It always had the speed, it had the traction. There was all sorts of rule wrangling at the time, but they managed to get round it, and it's great to see this car climbing the hill climb here, 60.62. Frank Lyons is currently quickest with the Formula 5000, the Gurney Chevy, 60.62. It's close for the touring car. Second position goes the Hepolite. Rover. Now, Bill Shepard is in the X-Jack Sears Championship winning Ford Galaxy. This car from 1963, and Bill Shepard specialises in these tail-wagging yak tacks. He's got all of that grunt. Has he got enough go to go with it? 60.62 is the time that he's got to try and beat. You're asking a lot of a touring car to beat a Formula 5000 single-seater racing car, but it's going to be close. 60.62, 60.76 is what he does. That puts him second fastest. A really good effort. The track is a lot narrower when you're driving a car like that, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Meanwhile, at the front wall, here comes BUY1. It is the Jaguar Mark 1 of Grant Williams. This has always been rapid throughout the entire weekend. I thought he was going to brush the straw bales on his left-hand side as he came through. Can't they see? He's going to go wide. I thought he was going to go into the bales. 60.62. He goes quickest by 1.68 seconds. Fantastic. It's Jaguar beating an F3000. 
5,000, sorry. That car from 1959. The Mark 1 Jaguar from 1959 is fastest. This is Franck Viola with the Euro version of a NASCAR. It races in its own series. It's got a very, very big engine in terms of power. It's also got a very, very big wheelbase, so it fills an awful lot of Goodwood. But Frank Viola has been getting quicker and quicker across the weekend as he now accelerates up towards Flint Wall. Let's see what he can do here. Can he beat a 58.94? Just to put it in context, if a car of this decade can't beat a Jaguar of 1959, there's some explaining to do. But it's an illustration of how quick Grant Williams is, because this is going to be a 58.39, which will put him top. So then, it's the Euro NASCAR that's quickest from the Jaguar Mark 1 as we now go to Italy. It is Tom Andrew in the Alfa Romeo, the 155, shades of 1994 in the British Touring Car Championship. It's a car from the Italian series that Antonio Tamburini drove. It's in the livery that Gabriele Tarquini took to British Touring Car title success in 1994. There were wrangles about all of this uh, in terms of the rear wing because it came in the boot and Alfa Romeo exploited the race regulation but it was a championship winning car and super touring was never really the same again tom andrew drives it tom andrew goes ninth on a 64.83 great to see the alpha 155 now then here is holly mason frankiti in the lola cosworth a two litre screamer mounted in the back of this sports car pretty little sports car that it is as well she drives it well she comes through past the braking area into Malcolm, and she soon gets on the throttle a real crisp sounding engine her uh, intermediate was a 26.3 so she's on the pace as she comes up towards the flint wall it's a car that her father raced at Le Mans with great success and Holly Mason Frank Hitty then heading towards the timing line uh, the target remember is still a 57.93 you're getting into late 1970s purpose-built sports racing cars here it's going to be close 56 57 point no 58.23 for second fastest second quickest then Holly Mason and Frank Kitty. Here you've got Jerome Galpin making his way up the hill in another of the Euro NASCARs. This is the guy that promotes and organises the championship that runs on well, some ovals, but mainly road courses. So this is a car that can go left and right. And it's going to go very quickly indeed. It lifts an inside front as it comes through the top left-hander, and he goes quickest by three seconds of 54.7. We're getting quicker and quicker and quicker. Here is the 1992 Benetton Ford V8 that Michael Schumacher shared with Martin Brundle, who has been here at Goodwood in 2018. He won his first ever Formula One Grand Prix in this car. A 54.7 is the time to beat. Lorena McLaughlin at the wheel and comes over the line now and that's a 57.61 from Lorena McLaughlin goes second fastest in that car that Michael Schumacher scored his first Grand Prix win with Spa 92. It's time for the British Touring Car Shootout and the first one to take to the hill is Rob Austin. It's the first time he's been here, he confessed he didn't really know which way the hill went yesterday. He's now confessing to a level 9 hangover having enjoyed the ball last night. But Rob Austin never lacks commitment. This new car for this year, the Alfa Romeo Giulietta, had a podium finish on its first race weekend at Brands Hatch. It's run by HMS Racing, Simon Belcher's team. Simon himself, a touring car racer and a jet ski champion. So a Adrenaline pours through the veins of the driver of the team, and Rob Austin goes through Malcolm Corner. Now, he's not quite on the pace of the fastest time to the first intermediate, which is, by the way, on the braking area into Malcolm. Well, that was set by the NASCAR that's currently top of the pile on a 54.7. So, as David mentioned, this is a, a shootout within the bigger shootout. We've got Rob Austin, the first of our six British touring car racers, battling to see what time they can do. The fastest time that we saw yesterday was a 52.98 second run. It's going to be a bit more for Worcestershire's Rob Austin as he crosses the finish line, a 65.53. That's the target. 65.53, the time to beat for Tom Ingram, currently second in the British Touring Car Championship, which celebrates its 60th anniversary this year. Tom Ingram, former Ginetta champion, the reigning independence champion in the BTCC. The car, a two-litre turbo Toyota Avensis, it's run by Speedworks Motorsport, the Northwich-based team of Christian and Amy Dick, and Tom is one of the new wave, the young guns of the BTCC. He's coming up towards that intermediate split. Let's compare it with Rob Austin, the first runner in this British Touring Car Shootout. Austin did a 
one. Tom Ingram's done a 25.7. He's nine miles an hour faster on that uh, braking area into Malcolm Corner. He's already out of the sunshine, into the shadows, uh, into the sunshine again as he goes through Carnay seat towards the top of the hill. It doesn't look steep, but I can assure you that it is. The time to beat of Austin at 65.5. Three. Tingram over the timing line, 55.92. He's the quicker of the two thus far. And now what can Matt Neal do? Triple British touring car champion, well over 60 touring car race wins. Matt Neal blasts away from the line. The new Honda Civic Type R is in business then. Matt Neal, winner at Thruxton earlier on in the season. He's won three British Touring Car titles. He knows every trick in the book, but does he know how to get up Goodwood quicker than Tom Ingram, who at the moment is the fastest at the BTCC shootout? He's having a go, isn't he, David? Because he was really drifting over to the outside of the corner through that right-hander. There's a big crown in the road, and if you get the wrong side of that crown, you lose the positive camber, and it starts to push away. Out of Malcolm he goes. He is on a par in time at that intermediate split with Tom Ingram, who is quickest by the time he got to the top of the hill with the British Touring Car Runners. Therefore, the time to beat is a 55.92. One more corner to go. Matt Neal is on it. Matt Neal is not here for a Santan. He wants to win the Touring Car Shootout in the 60th year of the BTCC. It is a 55.13. 55.13. That means he's the top Touring Car and he's second overall in the shootout behind NASCAR technology. Josh Cook is go. Double race winner this season for Power Max Racing with the Vauxhall Astra. He's another young gun within the British Touring Car Championship. Runs his own Renault Clio race team. And Josh, race instructor, race driver, is very rapid indeed. And we're about to see that borne out here on the Goodwood Hill. Looks quicker to me, David, with uh, the, the pictures we're getting. He was quickest to the first 100 metres. He's got to beat a 25-6 to the intermediate. He does a 24, so he's quicker, quicker. He's going well for Josh Cook with the Vauxhall Astra. Now the hill really starts to go up. Horsepower has to be your friend. How late can you go towards the Flint Wall? If you hit the Flint Wall, there's only ever going to be one winner if you get it wrong. He did 98 miles an hour through the first speed trap. He is absolutely on it here. 55.13, the McNeil time to beat. He's going to do it surely. This is fantastic. Josh Cook does a 54.06. 54.06. He goes top in the British Touring Car Shootout. Adam Morgan blasts away for Sicily Motorsport. Adam has been a race winner this season. He came out of historic rallying into Ginetta's, into the BTCC, and Adam Morgan is another very rapid driver within this 60th anniversary of the British Touring Car Championship. He skims the lawn, cuts the grass on his way up the hill. What little grass there is here in the summer of 2018, that's for sure. It's hot, but that means that the tarmac is warm, the tires will be grippy. Yo, oh, he's wide, he's wide, but he keeps his toe in. Rallying, if ever you needed the experience, Adam, has come home to roost here at Goodwood on the exit of Malcolm Corner, kept his toe in, pedal to the metal, do not lift. The time to beat by the time he gets to the top of the hill was Josh Cook's 54.06, time ticking away. He's got four seconds to go. He can see the finish line. It's ticking away. Is he going to do it? Oh, 54.88 seconds. He goes second in the touring car shootout. Goodwood track tester Andrew Jordan, the 2013 British touring car champion, is go. This, perhaps the car to beat in the touring car shootout. Andrew could possibly do this climb with his eyes closed. He knows his way around here better than many. The BMW 125i M Sport with Andrew Jordan at the wheel. Now he did a 52.98 second run in qualifying yesterday, but is it maybe a little bit too hot? That is a question. Is it gonna be attacking those tires a little bit too much? He's up on the intermediate split, 96 miles an hour. Not as fast as Josh Cook into Malcolm, but now he can use his rallycross experience because that's where he cut his teeth. There's nobody around him. He doesn't need to look in his mirrors, David. He's only got to look one way, I remind you the time to beat at the moment a 54.06. It's going to be good for Andrew Jordan. It is going to be the top touring car time, 
8 seconds. Andrew Jordan, the 2013 BTCC champion, wins the Touring Car Shootout here at the 2018 Goodwood Festival of Speed, presented by MasterCard. A great drive up the hill. Andrew Jordan wins the Touring Car Shootout from Josh Cook. Uh, and if we want to look at the overall times, taking the Touring Cars and everybody else into comparison for the moment, it's Andrew Jordan, the quickest, on a 52.58 from Josh Cook, 54.06. Jerome Galpin third, 54.75. Adam Morgan is fourth ahead of Matt Neal and then Tom Ingram. Lorena McLaughlin is seventh and Rick Woods, Vauxhall Cavalier, Mark One. The Mega Bertha is eighth fastest. Wow, what a shootout we're having. Draw breath, ladies and gentlemen. Andrew Jordan, top of the pile. He has gone four tenths of a second faster than he did in qualifying yesterday. The rest of the runners and riders. Holly Mason, Frank uh, ahead of the NASCAR. Grant Williams in that 1950s Mark 1 Jaguar. I take my hat off to you to do a sub-60 climb here at Goodwood. Ahead of the Formula 5000 Gurney. Bill Shepard in the big Galaxy. Ken Clark in the big Rover. Charles Rainford in the little Mini. And Henry Mann in the Ford Escort. The sort of in-between Escort, absolutely, really. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That's your top 16 after the shootout, but we're not done yet because we have still got another 20 to go and you've still got a lot of shuffling in this order. A great effort so far by Andrew Jordan. He wins the touring car shootout and let's see what else we have coming up with the rest of the field good to go. Congratulations, the first part of the shootout, the British Touring Car Championship shootout is complete and you are the winner. 52.58 seconds, victory by about one and a half seconds. That's a big margin. Good. Uh, I wish um, British Touring Cars was that easy because it's been an, a, quite an easy weekend, really. You know, six out of six we've been on top. And um, I said to the guys, I'm sure there's a 52.5 in it. I said, I think that's about it, really. But, but um, yeah, very happy with it. And uh, yeah, it's great to come and get a win here. And yeah, as I've said, we say it's just for a bit of fun, but of course we want to win. So it is. Drinks on Andrew Jordan tonight. Congratulations. Thank you. So back at the start line, we turn our attention next to the Chevrolet SS. This is NASCAR technology. Ed Berrier is due to be the man behind the wheel. The NASCAR cars have been shuffled around across a variety of pilots, all brave, over the course of this weekend. And this, you'll see, runs in the Elvis Presley tribute livery. The number 77 is a nod to the year in which the King passed away. Ed Berrier was a winner in 2000 at the Hickory Motor Speedway in the NASCAR Bush Series. Resplendent in its Elvis Presley tribute livery. And let's see whether Ed Berrier is going to be all shook up. He leaves the line in serious form as he goes through the first 100 metres in 5.51 seconds. Significantly quicker than we've seen from the touring car guys, but you're hardly comparing apples with apples, are you? Because this is, what, six, seven hundred horsepower, rear-wheel drive, big, wide tyres. He comes up to the intermediate split. He went through here yesterday at 85 miles an hour. He's five miles an hour faster here today, 90.6 miles an hour as he goes up towards the flint wall now these nascars obviously only designed to do one thing go left go a hill climb is another kind of engineering exercise but brave all of these drivers are in these big cars so let's see what he can do for a time he's got to try and beat a 52 5 8 that's your top time now courtesy of aj andrew jordan's time is going to remain that is a 54.15 that's now third fastest for ed Berrier. and we're going to move next to rally technology Carlos Sainz and Lewis Moyer did the World Rally Championship always with the orange Repsol colour scheme on their car. They did a season with the Ford Escort WRC. It was built in the UK by Malcolm Wilson and Carlos Sainz, two-time a World Rally Champion, now two-time a Dakar winner. But here we are with Nick Jarvis in uh, the Spaniard's old car. Four-wheel drive, two-litre turbo. He's struggling to get it all together, but he just about gets it through. Everybody in the grandstand near me craning their necks over to the right hand side to see if the tarmac car was going to go gravel rallying 
multi-purpose very nearly this Ford Escort. Nick Jarvis hustling on, gets the car now through Flint Wall and heading towards the timing line. He's going to try and beat a 52. Is that going to happen? I don't think it is. Then we need to see where the car will blend in relative to the other times. 52, 53, up towards the timing beam. Nick Jarvis does a 55.13. That's going to put him seventh fastest. The very latest DTM technology. This is Frank Beeler behind the wheel of the Audi RS5. Three times a Le Mans winner. 1991 DTM champion. 1995 British, uh, 96 British Touring Car champion. Winner of the Touring Car World Cup as well for Audi. And this the sort of car that has had a win this very day at Zandvoort in the hands of uh, Rene Rast. Frank Beeler on the hill. The tyres are normally for the longer DTM races. They won't be to full working temperature by the time the car gets to the top of the hill. But as you say, the experience of Beeler will be used to the fore here. It's got long legs, this car. It hasn't, unfortunately, for him today. And Goodwood got the sheer acceleration to launch him off the start line, but Beeler threads his way through. He's low in the car, he's way back in the car. Lots of aerodynamic devices. He doesn't want to take off on the, the straw bales on the side of the racetrack. He gets to the top of the hill, it's all done, it's all safe for the German. 56.04 seconds for Beeler. And so that puts him ninth fastest in the DTM Audi. Formula 5000 machinery blasts away from the line from 1970. This is the very brave Matthew Wurr aboard a car that Derek Bell took a race win with a Monza in 1970. Derek has been reunited with the car this weekend. And Matthew Wurr, who used to race big, hairy Morgan plus eights, and then TVR Tuscans is trying to tame it up the hill. He's on the wet tyres, which are softer, but there's a bit more movement within the, uh, the rubber and the carcass. He's late on the brakes, he's going to spin it, he's going to spin it! No, don't hit anything! He's just come to a halt. He's got away with it. The tyres were moving around quite a bit. You saw him get a little bit out of shape at the first and then the second corner. And thankfully, he didn't hit the straw bales. Let's have a look at this. Now, you come over a crest. You can't see where the corner is until it's too late. He chucked it in. He was going to spin it. It was all under control. And once you spin, there ain't no more skill involved. And fortunately, he didn't hit anything. Thank goodness for that. The car and driver are perfectly OK. Not the last, I fancy, David, to have a bit of a moment at Malcolm. It does go to show how much commitment all the drivers are putting in. It's only a bit of fun, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> Until you put your crash helmet on, you tighten up the belts and you put your gloves on. He fires it back up and he will now continue his run up towards the top of the hill. Give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. He was having a go. Matthew uh, carries on. This is a case of as you were, I suppose, now, because he continues the run and Matthew will make his way red-faced up to the end. But again, you can't argue with the guys for showing so much commitment, putting so much into this run. But one of the things I learned when I was hill climbing is you've got to risk it. You've got to risk the car. You've got to lean on it at every corner. And if you're not prepared to do that, you won't get the time. Very true. Well, the red flag came out just while Matthew Wurr was being retrieved. Uh, he's got to the end, so the course is clear. And as soon as the officials are happy, then we'll get the next cars up the hill. But a reminder that it's Andrew Jordan still the fastest on a 52.58. As now to the line comes the Maserati MC12, the Goodwood Scent 100. Not a car that raced in period, but a car made out of other bits of a Maserati MC12. <laughs> Away from the line, blast the Maserati MC12 with Michael Bartels at the wheel. One time Grand Prix driver, FIA GT champion in a Maserati MC12. FIA GT1 world champion in a Maserati MC12. And a very accomplished GT racer. And a very accomplished hill climber here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Back in 2014, he was a podium man after the shootout in a similar Maserati MC12. It sounds glorious. He's quickest at the intermediate split on a 23.87 second split there. He rushes past the bales, closer to the bales on the flint wall. No surprise there, but it's now he can stretch the legs of this car up towards the top of the hill. This should put him top, shouldn't it? Because he's got a bit of downforce, he's got a big engine, he's got a lead and right foot, 52 to beat, and he does a 51.33. Michael Bartels goes top then in the Maserati, and at the top of the hill, everybody looking at the screen, looking at the data and seeing where their cars might drop to. 
motor racing legend, Emmanuel Ipiro in a NASCAR. Only could it happen at Goodwood. He's won Le Mans, he's raced in Grand Prix, he's a touring car champion, he's sideways, he's up the hill. He's having a go, isn't he, David? He's having a go for you watching trackside. Look at this, 800 plus horsepower being put through those rear wheels. And now it dances its way up the straight. He's coming into Malcolm. He can't see the apex until it's too late. He's got a little bit of opposite lock. He has to get out of the throttle. He has to wait just a little bit. But 92 miles an hour on the approach to Malcolm means he's meaning business. Next intermediate coming up. It's a 38.1 that he's got to beat. He did a 40.62 through there. He might have frightened himself, but no, it's Emanuele Piro. He gets towards the top of the hill. 51.3, he's not going to beat, but a valiant try. Absolutely right. It's a 54.71, doesn't go top, but it was a good effort. Don't forget, Emanuele hardly ever drives a car like this. He's probably never sat in it until the weekend, and to go fifth <laughs> is a mighty effort. The Jaguar in the hands of Matthew George. Glass away, Matt George in the GT4 spec. Jaguar F-Type from the British GT Championship. A GT4 car in theory, closer to a production-based car. He's close to the edge of the road, he's close to the grass there. And this, Toby Moody, shows commitment. He is, he's over the wrong side of the crown in the road there, but you've got to go wide. It's a trade-off, isn't it? Now he can settle in. It may only be five or six seconds between the beginning of the home straight to Malcolm Corner, but when you're in a car, it feels like 20 seconds. You can settle yourself and concentrate on the next breaking point. 38.1 is the target of the flint wall. He comes through here, and the, he's done a 40.21. He has a couple of seconds off, but the time he's got to beat is a 51.33 of the Maserati MC12. Oh, leaning on the car through the top left-hander. And for Matthew George, it's a 54.18. He goes to fifth. Good effort by Matthew George. This, a small 24 hours winning car. It's a Romain Dumas car with Stefan Ortelli and Mark Lee. It won the 2003 Spa 24 hours. Flora Moulin, a classic race car dealer, is the man behind the wheel of a car rally period by Freisinger Motorsport in NGT, the sort of normal GT category. But there's nothing normal about the way this is going to be driven. A little bit of dust on the track as he goes through the right-hander in front of the house. The car's dancing, it's drifting over the road. Hard on the brakes, but those big, fat, slick tyres working hard. Now he can use the acceleration of the 911. The weight over the rear wheels, it can really hunker down over the rear suspension. Gives himself space. Now he can stretch the legs of the Stuttgart car. 38.1 at the intermediate split. He was in touch on a 39.1. Can he beat? A 51.33. Touch and go, could do it. The teeth on the front gobbling up the real estate as he goes over the timing line to go third. 53.34. Florent Moulin has not done any time rounds all weekend, but when he needs to, he certainly shows the energy that needs to be put in. Rallycross technology next. The old Mark Rennison Ford RS200. It won the British Rallycross Championship. The man behind the wheel is Steve Harris. Now, the measure of these rallycross cars is their acceleration from a standing start. We have a measure at the first 100 metres. Yesterday he did 4.7 seconds to the first 100 metres. It shows that it is head and shoulders above a lot of the other cars, but then its weakness is that it might not have the sheer top speed. Is top gear long enough, the drag from the rear wing? But he's hard on the brakes, he's a little bit sideways. He dances it into the corner, almost a Scandinavian flick. Now he unleashes the power, 550, maybe even 600 horsepower. He comes up towards the flint wall. He comes out of the flint wall. The split is a little bit long. I think there's a timing error, but he's on his way towards the top of the hill. The time he's got to try and beat is a 51.33. And look at this, he's absolutely on the limit. Steve Harris goes through. The time that he's offered is a 62.01, but I suspect there might be something in the system that will be better than that. We'll double check because it looked quicker. He might have broken the beam before the run was started. Possibly so, possibly so. Ready to go, Ricky Collard in the BMW M4 DTM. He blasts away from the line. Ricky, who is a BMW junior driver, his father Rob is a star of the British Touring Car Championship. His grandfather, the late Mick Duffy Collard, a star against Barry Lee in hot racing on the ovals. And Ricky does not lack commitment nor bravery. Look at 
and this. Look at the rooster tail coming out from behind the rear of the BMW M4. He was staggeringly fast and late on the brakes into Malkin in qualifying. He did 110 mile an hour then, a little bit slower today, 104 miles an hour. But this thing really has got long legs. It did 121 miles an hour over the finish line at the top of the hill. Intermediate, he's up. This could be at the next best time of day with Ricky Collard, the youngster, the BMW motorsport junior driver, 51.3 to beat. Ricky Collard breaks the beam and he does it. 50.82 seconds. Ricky Collard goes quickest. Steve Harris in the RS200 second on 50.95. Michael Bartels in the Maserati goes third. We turn from rally cross cars, touring cars, to single-seaters, a specially adapted single-seater for Billy Munger. He lost both his legs in a huge accident at Donington Park 12 months or so ago. This is the Tatius Cosworth chassis run by Carlin for the British F3 Championship. And Billy Munger, for whom there is a huge amount of support, is about to display a huge amount of talent. And a huge amount of speed as he comes into the braking area towards Malcolm in qualifying. He was second fastest at 104.6 miles an hour. He's done 115.7 miles an hour. That is how committed the brave Billy Munger is on the brakes into Malcolm past the Flint Wall. This could be a good time. He's up by 1.78 seconds at the Flint Wall. This shootout just sees people getting quicker and quicker. He's going to do a time quicker than a 50.82. He's going to smash it to go top of the pile. A 48.31 second run. A round of applause <laughs> for Britain's Billy Munger. Billy Munger goes fastest then, and now we are into our final few cars, so this is where it gets even more dramatic. Mike Skinner blasts away in the Toyota Tundra. It looks fast, it sounds fast, and there's a good reason for that. It is fast. Now, if anybody has commitment at Goodwood, it's Mike Skinner, a former podium man here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed a couple of years ago. Now he can use the sheer speed that he would use at Talladega or Daytona. Good Goodness me, it hoves into view like a rocket. The V8 pusher on power howls up the hill towards the Flint Wall. This is hill climbing. This is fabulous stuff. You're asking an American pickup truck to go quicker than a single-seater racing car, but if anyone can do it, Mike Skinner is your man. The time he's got to beat is a 48.31. He is throwing everything at this as he comes up towards the line. 47, 48, 25. He goes quickest. 48.25, Mike Skinner goes top of the times. And he crossed the finish line at 140.3 miles an hour, just six hundredths of a second split first and second place. Michael Lyons blasts away from the line in this Lola T400. It's a car that's 43 years old, and yet Michael Lyons, who specialises in historic cars as well as modern GT cars, will put everything on the line here. It's very quick off the start line, David, because it's got all the weight in the rear and it's got a lot of suspension travel. He was uber fast on the intermediate split speed time, and then he's quick again. He's quick again as he's 22.09 seconds. He's up at the intermediate. Now, can he carry that advantage a little bit further up the hill to the next split? And he can. He's six tenths of a second up. He's got the rear out a little through Carnay's seat. One more corner to go. It's flat through here. The time to beat at 48.2. And Michael Lyons goes fastest again. 47.86 seconds. They're getting quicker and quicker and faster with 138 mile an hour over the line. Next, you are going to see a BMW like no other. This car is capable of 211 miles an hour. Jürgen Weininger in the Jan V8 engine. BMW M3 blasts away from the line. You're riding on board. It makes a fabulous sound. And this is going to be driven very hard indeed. And a big slide saved. Another big wobble. Now it's sort of in a straight line. It's a Formula One engine in a BMW M3 E36. A German driver called Georg Plaza built the car. He unfortunately isn't with us here. No anymore. But this is in the memory of Georg Plaza with finding it, rushing up towards the flip wall. It's gone. It's that quick. The intermediate split, 35.6. And he's a second up on the previous Lovelet Chevy time of Michael Ryan. This could be another one that goes top of the pile. 47 to beat a 46.43. Jürgen Weidinger 
1.4 seconds quicker than anybody else. Jörg Weidinger goes fastest. We look at Rod Millen in the Toyota Celica Pikes Peak. He is another Goodwood hero. He's got the 10th best ever time up this hill climb. Let's see what he can do now. We're into the final few runners. The pressure is on and Rod Millen is go. And his advantage is off the line to the first 100 metres. He did 4.66 seconds yesterday. Not quite as quick today. Now he gets into his stride, grabbing a gear. We're live on board with Rod Millen's crash helmet. This is what he said. He even waves to the crowd. Really? 21.9 is the split. Just eight tenths of a second off the fastest time to that point. But the sheer acceleration with this Toyota that's got 800, 850 horsepower. But moreover, David, it's the bravery of Miller. He never quite cracked 10 minutes up the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb when it was half tarmac and half gravel. But his bravery is never going to go away. Absolutely right, Toby. To the line comes Rod Millen. He won't go quickest, but it will put him fifth. 48.50. Rod Millen goes fifth, and we have only got four more cars to go. Justin Law on the line. Justin Law ready to go in the IMSA American spec. Jaguar, this car from the sports racing legends class that we've had here this weekend. Justin is the man with the third best and the fourth best times up the hill. It takes you to the early 1990s. It's going to be driven hard. It's going to be driven with a huge amount of commitment. Justin Law almost on the grass. Here he comes. He did a 45.42 second run yesterday. If he can replicate that time, he's going to go top of the pile. The car hasn't got the sheer acceleration off the line and out of the slower corners. But boy, oh boy, believe me, it was the fastest over the finish line yesterday on 150. That's a new outright record on speed over the line. He's not quite in touch on the intermediate split. But now he can really stretch its legs. 46.4 to beat. 46.66. He goes to second, just 0.23 of a second back. 7-litre engine V12 power. Is it enough to keep him second, or will this car go faster? Jeremy Smith in the Penske Chevrolet PC22. And he's got a problem because the car creeps over the line and then it stalls, and he's done that before this weekend. They're going to have to drag him back now. Are we going to be lenient and let him go again, or does that count as a fail? In hill climbing rules, David, a run is only a run when your rear axle crosses the start line. So it's an element of giving people another chance. The reason a lot of people stall on the start line is that there's a lot more rubber underneath the car there rather than the tyre warming area. So when they let the clutch in, they just need to give it a few more revs than normal. I do have to say, the onboard live camera shot from over his left shoulder is absolutely what Jeremy will be experiencing. That's the kind of view that he will have. There's a lot of history behind this car, and yet he risks it. It's the car that Emerson Fittipaldi took to Indy 500 honours in 1993. Nigel Mansell made a bit of the restart, and Emo was there to capitalise. It has got success in its veins. Jeremy Smith has driven it very quickly all weekend. He is third after the point five run yesterday. Jeremy Smith is going. The Penske accelerates up the hill, up through the gears. Through the shade, turn right, head towards Park Strait. Jeremy Smith, very rapid. And he's fastest of anybody to the first 100 metres. A little bit of opposite lock. He grabs another gear with his right hand. It's a stick shift, remember. This is a manual gearbox. He rockets into view, past the Vulcan intermediate split, past the speed counter. Now he can unleash that turbocharged power up towards the flip wall. Deep breath, right, then left, then the long left towards Carnet's seat. Hold it, hold it, foot to the floor, the time to beat. At the moment is a 46.43 seconds. He went quicker yesterday, time to beat as he crosses the line. Will be confirmed because of the timing problem because of the second run. So it's in the system, we'll confirm it as soon as we can. And uh, as soon as the time is confirmed, we will bring that to you. But it was a great effort put in by Jeremy Smith. So there are two to go, and we're into electric power. Peter Dunbreck in the Neo EP9 will be next, and then it's going to be a Roman Duma. There is the Neo. That is going to be the next car away. So we're just having to hold that until the time for Jeremy Smith is confirmed. And anything better than a 46.4 will put him top, but I fear 
he's not going to be able to combat the efforts of the next, indeed the final two cars. Peter Dumbreck, he did a 47.3 yesterday, did a 44.4. He went quicker again this morning. Uh, he was second fastest off the start line yesterday. The acceleration with the all-electric four-wheel drive uh, Neo, it holds the Nürburgring all-electric track record. The Nordschleifer at six minutes and 47 seconds about a second off a p1lm mclaren kind of time around the nordschleifer dumbreck of course knows his way around the nordschleifer and after this weekend he knows his way up goodwood hill jeremy smith's time was a 46.78 third fastest so jörg weidinger is quickest in the bmw justin law is second in the jaguar third jeremy smith in the penske fourth in the background there michael lyons you're finding her at the forefront there uh, fourth in that lola chevrolet that is what 43 years old mike skinner fifth and billy munger sixth now on the times 0.23 of a second covering first and second position the penske as you say david going into third position so it's the european hill climb car the bmw e36 with the v8 judd engine that is top of the pile at the moment therefore vendinger is guaranteed a podium position two more cars to run the Neo is on the line. Peter Dumbreck started off as a single-seater star. He went for a time into the DTM. He has been a GT racer of great repute for a long, long time. And now the officials get the nod to say, yep, we're all good. We've got the time. And Peter Dumbreck is just being given some last-minute instructions and information as to why he's being held there. But as soon as possible, the car will be allowed forward and we will be ready to go. It is between Peter Dumbreck and Roman Duma. It is the Neo EP9 versus the Volkswagen ID are Pikes Peak because these are the fastest two cars that we have had up the hill all weekend. Peter Dumbreck just goes backwards a little bit in theory now so he can make his way forward, get some warmth into the rubber and then he should be good to go. Electric technology will round out the shootout. Can they beat a 46-4-3? On the evidence of the weekend the answer should be yes but which one will be top? It's an interesting scenario between the Neo and the VW of Roman Dumas because Dumas has got has got about the same power, but he hasn't got the top speed that Dumbreck has. So with finding a quickest at the moment on a 46.43, there he is on the left-hand side. Justin Law with his arms folded just to the right-hand side. He's second fastest at the moment on a 46.66. And Jeremy Smith, who's probably still shaking his way out of the Penske Chevrolet from 1993, is in third position. Meanwhile, the penultimate car to take to the hill in the shootout. It is the Neo EP9. Peter Dumbreck is the man. Behind the wheel, Peter Dumbreck blasts away from the line. Let's see what he can do. The time to beat is a 46.43. That should fall. He's on the same pace as his qualifying run to the first 100 metres. But where he makes the time is on sheer top speed. He's off the track, but he gets it back on. He did 117 miles an hour on the approach to Malkin. He rockets into view like an F-16 jet fighter. The tyres are scrubbing away. 118 miles an hour he did on the approach to Malkin. Now he goes up towards the flint wall one way, then the other. The, the split to beat a 33-11. He's on the pace. Here goes Peter Dumbreck. The Time to beat a 46.43. Can he do it? He should do it. It's a 42, 43. How much quicker can he go? 44.32. Peter Dumbreck goes fastest. 44.32 seconds. He goes top. Even Jörg Weidinger, who's just been defeated, forces a smile. The fastest ever run that Dumbreck has done up the hill. He nearly beats Roman Dumas's qualifying time. This is the last car. This is the business. Roman Dumas, he's won at Le Mans. He's a Pikes Peak record holder. He's a rally fan. He had a big moment early on in the day down at the first corner, but he managed to save it, and he knows what he's up against. He's got to beat 44.32. He did a 43.05 in the qualifying run yesterday. The officials just hold the car until the instruction can be given, and then he's going to light up the Goodwood Hill. 1100, uh, 1,100 kilos that he's got in this car, approaching some sort of 600 horsepower, electric power, four-wheel drive. He's not just a Le Mans winner, as you've said, David, but he goes rallying in his spare time. He drives anything and everything. He drove at Le Mans this year, went back to Pikes Peak. Thank you very much. I'll take the victory. Comes back here to Europe, and here he is sitting on the start line. The Indianapolis yard of bricks that are set into the road are already being crossed by Roman 
Monte Mas, the first 100 meters, amazingly fast, half a second quicker than the best time so far. So he is on the money and he is quicker in that first intermediate. So 44.32 to beat. Is he going to be able to do it? Here comes Malcolm Corner. He turns the car through that left. He's up at the next split as well. So Roman Dumar is looking good here. He's quicker in the first two splits. He is by a full second at Malcolm already. He's past the Flint Wall. The Frenchman trying hard with the Volkswagen. He's 0.83 of a second up as he goes towards the top of the hill. One more corner to go. 44.32 seconds to beat for Dumas and he's done it 43.86 seconds best time of day Roman Dumas it is who wins the shootout at the Goodwood Festival of Speed Roman Dumas it is with a 43.86 second run fantastic we have just witnessed some very brave guys putting everything on the line Roman Dumas wins the shootout Peter Dumbrecht second and then third Jörg, uh, is the uh, BMW of Jörg Weidinger fourth Justin Law fifth Jeremy Smith and sixth, Michael Lyons. And where does that put Romain in the all-time greats? Overall, in Goodwood history, it's the third fastest ever run of history. But more importantly, today, it's the quickest here this weekend. Romain du Roman Dumas with Volkswagen, victorious in 2018. Romain Dumas wins the shootout. Peter Dambrak, second fastest from Jörg Viding, a third. Justin Law, fourth. Jeremy Smith in the Penske, fifth. The head of Michael Lyons in the Lola Chevrolet T400. Mike Skinner, seventh in the NASCAR-style Toyota Tundra, and then Billy Munger in the Tatchers Formula 3 car with the Cosworth 2-litre engine, eighth fastest. Ninth, Rod Millen in the Toyota Celica Pikes Peak. Ricky Collard rounds out the top ten in the DTM BMW. Eleventh, Steve Harris in the RS200, and Michal Bartels, twelfth in the Maserati. Well, we have the outcome, the winner of the 2018 shootout at Goodwood. It's the start of the new generation. It's the first electric victory. Romain Dumas, 43.8 seconds. You're the winner. Yeah, it was a, was a, yeah, a good race. I mean, it uh, was not easy. As you saw this morning, the, the limit was uh, very close. Um, yeah, I mean, just made this run as clean as possible, no risk. Um, but at the end, yeah, it was OK. I mean... Uh, we have to come back next year to try to <laughs> to beat the, <laughs> the bigger record. So, but it's okay. I mean, the target was to 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 win the electric records. That was clear. So for sure, yesterday uh, when I made 43.0, I was started to think about possible we can get the F1 uh, record. But this morning, you know, after the the small off road, I said, okay, we <laughs> we will wait a little bit for next year and think about. Exactly. 12 months to plan it. Congratulations, Roma. Dumas, victory in the Volkswagen ID R Pikes Peak. Round of applause for everyone for Roman Dumas. So all the other drivers very appreciative of his efforts. And I know all of you on the hill enjoyed that here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Absolutely breathtaking. And that 43.86 seconds is enough to win the shootout and utterly obliterate the previous <laughs> all-electric record, which was a 47.34. Electric cars, first and second, you know, boxing out the podium here, David, in 2018. Uh, the Volkswagen and the Neo as the Duke of Richmond presents the bottle of Verve Clico to the yeah, Frenchman. Yeah, yeah. Have something from your own country back, but make sure that you uh, share it with the mechanics, I'm sure he's saying. Yeah, I mean, it's not far away, is it, that 41.9 seconds? He's under two seconds away. He went a little quicker in qualifying. You know, stickier tyres, different tyres. There's not a problem with weight in that car, but uh, he doesn't want to risk it either because that's a one-off and it's a museum piece already, isn't it? But from every driver's point of view that we've seen, 